Hello and welcome everyone to the fourth and final session of the Brain Prize uh, meeting in 2021. Um, I'm really very honoured indeed to be chairing this uh, session, which I think will um, be really fantastic with lots of um, very interesting work to hear about, as well as our panel discussion. Um, I have to admit that uh, I'm particularly excited because as someone who works in the field of neurodevelopmental disorders, um, the winners of uh, this year's Brain Prize um, are, are real kind of icons in the field, and I confess to being something of a, of a super fan for both of them. Um, so we've got a, a bunch of talks today. Uh, we're uh, going to kick off with uh, Jeffrey Newell um, and followed by Flash Talks, uh, which come from Denmark, the UK and Canada. Um, and I'll introduce them when we get there. Uh, following that, we're going to have a talk from uh, one of the winners, Huda Zogby. Uh, and, uh, and then after that, we will have a panel discussion. Um, in this case, it will be with the Brain Prize winners, so with Huda Zogby and Adrian Bird, where we'll get to hear a bit more about their science, their journey, um, and their outlook for the future. Um, and, uh, and you can all ask questions uh, that you'd love to hear answered for that session. Uh, for those of you who um, are new today, uh, just we just got some, I'm going to repeat some housekeeping. So uh, if you want to ask a question, please post your question in the chat window, which is probably on the right of the screen, although sometimes it's below. Um, you can post it at any time, either during the talk or during the Q&A session. Um, and then uh, if you, uh, anyone, if you're looking, you can vote for the questions that you'd particularly like answered by adding a thumbs up. And, uh, and I'll then be able to select the ones that are the most popular. Um, for the Q&A flash talks in particular, uh, we'll have the Q&A session at the end of all three talks, uh, but please go ahead and ask your question at any time uh, and just say who the question is for uh, so that it helps us uh, direct the question. Um, and that's also true for the panel discussion. You can ask an open-ended question or you can just ask uh, a directed question and just say who it's for. And of course, the very exciting announcement of the 2021 winners will follow uh, uh, this uh, panel session um, and uh, do stay on because we're all looking forward to hearing that. Okay, so I think without further ado, I will uh, introduce our first speaker of today, who is uh, Jeffrey Newell from the Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And he is going to tell us about getting ready for clinical trials in Rett syndrome. Great, and thank you. Uh, thank you for to the organizers, and thank you all for being here today. Um, these are just my disclosures. I jumped ahead of slide already. Um, okay, so we're talking about Rett syndrome today, uh, which is really the focus of the winners of this brain prize. And Rett syndrome is a disorder that has a very characteristic pattern of disease. So people with Rett syndrome have a normal initial birth and a normal development for the first six months, at least apparently normal. Um, then they have a period where they're not quite maintaining um, their, my, achieving their milestones. So we consider this the stagnation period. And then they undergo the re regression and specifically they lose the ability to have a spoken language and they lose the ability to have volitional hand use. Now this regression is not um, relentless. It ends at a period of time and then they enter what's called the stationary phase. Um, and they have a number of clinical features that come up um, during this time that I'm going to talk about. Um, so they don't continue to lose and they're stationary. And then in the later in life, probably in their teens and young adulthood, they have what we call a late motor deterioration, um, where they have more um, problems with motor function, really a lot because they start having more Parkinsonian features. Now, they have a specific gait abnormality. And here's a video of a girl um, that was taken a while ago. It's an old friend of mine and who is going to refer back to her. And you see she has an ataxic, apraxic gait. She's sort of stumbling and wandering. She also is on her toes. And they also have repetitive hand movements. And here's the same uh, girl showing the uh, um, I hand don't have movements the, uh... um, where she's clapping. They also kind of classically they're ringing and washing. Now this is an excellent disorder and it primarily affects girls and affects about one in 10,000 female births. A lot of the work I'm gonna talk about today is referring to the natural history study that was conducted in the US started in 2003. Um, this is funded by the NIH. I um, mean, we have multiple sites, 14 across the US and we've enrolled over 1500 people. We've learned a lot about Rett syndrome um, from this. And so for example, um, we know that people with Rett syndrome 
are small, they have growth failure, and we will be able to produce um, growth charts uh, that are Rett syndrome specific, and they're the progression of the height on the top and the weight on the bottom of the people with Rett syndrome is shown in blue, compared to typically developing controls um, in orange. Furthermore, um, they have, we've known that they've had microcephaly, and again, we on the top, we have the head circumference growth. Now, if we go back to birth, their head size and even their weight and their height are normal, so this falls off over time. On the bottom, you see the body mass index, um, and you see that people with Rett syndrome are on average smaller, uh, have lower body mass index compared to uh, typically developing individuals, but you do see on the top at the 98th percentile, um, people with Rett syndrome might be above uh, the typically developing individuals. And here's just a picture of two people giving this example. Now, the, the woman on the right is that same girl that we saw in the video. Um, she's just older now. Um, there are a variety of behavioral um, features that happen in Rett syndrome. One might be the autistic features, which is more prevalent and common um, during the regression. However, it may persist in some individuals, especially those who are higher functioning in the motor sense. Um, they're considered to have a severe intellectual disability. However, we really don't have a sense of their IQ since they can't speak and use their hands. It's very hard to conduct um, IQ testing and they clearly have much better receptive language than expressive language. They also have a number of other behavioral problems such as anxiety and these seem, especially the mixed behavioral issues, seem to be more common in younger and again less severely affected individuals in terms of their motor function. Um, as I, we've talked about the hand stereotypies, uh, with the natural history study, we've been able to characterize the different types of hand stereotypies that are common and then the change on the bottom over time and age. And seizures are very common in Rett syndrome. They have grossly abnormal EEGs. And in the green showing um, across age, the proportion that have had some kind of seizures, you see that people with typical Rett syndrome, if, is nearly 100%, 95% over the course of their lifetime. People have breathing abnormalities. Here's a video of a girl and see she's sort of hyperventilating and then holding her breath. There she's grinding her teeth, which is also another common problem. And in the natural history study, we've been able to, again, look at the proportion of individuals who have, this was an example of breath holding, we also have hyperventilation, and over age and time, nearly all people with Rett syndrome have this breath holding and have hyperventilation at some point. Now, the severity uh, varies, as does the persistence. So um, this is showing on the um, y-axis the number of years an individual was in the study. And on the x-axis, those are individual lines. Every line going up is an individual person. And you see on the right side, all the group in red are people who, during the entire time they were in the natural history study, always were shown to have breathing problems. On the far left and all the ones who were in green, those are the small number of people who didn't show any breathing problems during the time of the natural history study. And the middle group are the ones that we might have, we call a relapsing remitting, where they might have the breathing problems and it might go away or it might come back. And so you can see there's different patterns which make some degree of complexity in terms of understanding the progression of the disease. Scoliosis is very common and it increases with age. Um, there's severe scoliosis in nearly 30% and about almost 20% of people will have to have surgery uh, to correct this. Autonomic features are common too, like this, um, the breathing, but also this um, vasomotor disturbances where it might be cold and blue, sometimes it might be hot and red, and these come in uh, uh, pa uh, paroxysms or spells. We also have cardiac rhythm abnormalities with uh, abnormal rates of uh, uh, beat-to-beat beat variations and increased risk of a propensity to a long QTC, which can cause a um, propensity to sudden unexpected death. We also have GI issues and uh, decreased bone density. 
Now, I, I mentioned this late motor decline, um, and we're really just starting to understand this better. And we're looking at this in relation to the onset of menarche. And in the top, this is graphing um, from age before and after menarche. Um, and you see a decline in sort of hyperkinetic features like truncal rocking um, around the time of from before to after menarche. And then you see an increase in these hypokinetic or bradykinetic features like we see in Parkinson's that increase after menarche. So you see uh, a compensatory decline in the hyperkinesis and in, uh, increase in the hypokinetic features. So of course, you know, we're really all here today to talk about the work of uh, Huda Zogby and Adrian Bird. And of course, Huda identified the genetic basis of Red syndrome, um, which is mutations in this methyl CPG binding protein 2 or MACP2. And with that, we understand that of the 95% of people who meet the clinical criteria for cl typical Red syndrome will have mutations in this, and typically they're de novo mutations. Now, although other people previously had uh, indicated that um, there are no boys with MECP2 mutation because they'd be embryonic lethal or die right away. That is not true. Um, we have known that there is a severe congenital encephalopathy that is associated with boys with MECP2 mutations. But in the natural history study, we've really been recognizing that there's a much broader phenotype. We've published uh, papers describing 30 boys with mutations, and it spans from um, what we understood as a severe congenital encephalopathy to much milder. And we really are just beginning to understand this. So it does not cause embryonic lethality, and there are boys with this mutation. And as we've heard also, there are boys that have too much MECP2 mutation, and that causes a severe neurodevelopmental disorder that has autism, seizures, absence, speech, and infections. And I would say it's as severe or more severe than Red syndrome. With this um, understanding of the genetic basis, we've been able to do genotype phenotype studies. So there are hundreds of different mutations that cause Rett syndrome, but there are eight common point mutations in different molecular groupings. And from that, we can understand that um, there are some mutations on the left side in uh, red and pink, like R13, uh, R133C, R306C, that on, on average are less severe than other mutations, such as these earlier truncating mutations, which are on the right, which are more severe. But importantly, you can see that there are people who have mild mutations who are very severe and people who have severe mutations who are very mild. So we cannot describe this for an individual, but more for a group basis. Now, we've heard already about uh, rodent models, and I'm not going to talk a lot about it, except for the fact that um, they really reproduce remarkably many of the clinical features. And I would say they have very high face validity. I'm not going to go through the details there on the left of some of the various things that have been shown. Um, but importantly, multiple different alleles have been generated. In fact, seven of the eight common point mutations have been created. And they show the nice genotype-phenotype relationship that we see in people uh, with the same mutations. Um, We've already heard a little bit, and we heard some nice talks yesterday from Jessica about using conditional knockouts and rescue alleles to understand the cell-specific roles, and of course, Adrian's work looking at temporal control. And uh, although people have said that you the females are have too variable phenotype to be able to study, that's not really true. The female heterozygous mice are the true cl preclinical model representing what we see in people, and they have robust phenotypes that can be observed not super late in life. So this is really what should be used. And finally, there have been rat model. There's a rat model that's been created, and it also shows phenotypic abnormalities. And that provides great advantages um, for different behavioral testing. And of course, the seminal work from Adrian Bird showing that you could restore MECP2 function in these male animals after they were symptomatic and reverse both the lethality and also a variety of the morphological and functional features really changed the entire approach to the field, that it gave us hope that we could um, at least create disease uh, modifying therapies, if not ultimately disease reversing therapies. And importantly, um, that was all in male mice, and Jim Eubanks has gone on and in female mice, even at a relatively late time point, 40 weeks, and the animals were symptomatic, turning the gene back on and getting MECP2 levels going from the expected 50% to 75%. And this rescued many of the features that were seen in these female animals. But it didn't rescue all of them. It actually, this is an example here on the bottom right, showing that it did not improve this motor coordination phenotype on the accelerator and rotor rod. And so I think there's an open question about is that 
an aspect of the timing that if the very late time, it's not as um, readily reversible, all the phenotypes, or that it is uh, a level that it didn't get enough, we only got 25% increase. But nonetheless, this all gave uh, great hope that we might be able to, again, approach this and use these animal models. And um, Murganka Sur's lab uh, treated the male Mekichi mice with a tripeptide derived from the amino terminus of insulin-like growth factor one called glypro glue, uh, glypromate, glypro um, And it improved many of the features. Um, and that led to two clinical trial pathways, one using the full-length IGF-1, um, which showed on a phase one trial to be safe and have some signals of efficacy, but a phase two trial um, did not reproduce those signals of efficacy. The other clinical development arm was using a drug called trofinitide. So I told you that uh, they treated the animals with a tripeptide derived from the amino terms of IGF-1, shown on the left. Trofinitide is that tripeptide. It has a methyl group added, which improves the drug qualities and allows it to be orally active. Two phase two trials have been conducted, and both of them showed that they were safe and, safe and had evidence of efficacy, and a phase three trial is underway, sponsored by Acadia. Similarly, animal work uh, had shown, have shown that uh, treatment with ketamine can improve some of the clinical features in the animal model. And so we're doing a clinical trial in using oral ketamine, which is a phase two crossover dose ascending trial sponsored by the Red Syndrome Research Trust. And a Anavax 273, which is a signal one receptor agonist, also showed improvement in, in the animal models of Red Syndrome. And so Anavax the company is sponsoring um, phase two and phase three trials either underway or proposed. But of course, these are all modifying, and, and Adrian's work said that you might be able to reverse it if you got the gene back on. And of course, that leads to the idea, of, well, couldn't we use gene therapy? There are some challenges to think about, of course, with gene therapy. Typical thing is trying to get to all the cells in the central nervous system. But in Rett syndrome, of course, we have the issue of overshooting, potentially causing a MACP2 duplication syndrome. That said, a number of people have done this in in, in mice and showed the ability to get it throughout the brain and improve features. And Adrian, you heard already, said that he could create a smaller mini gene and that also could be put into the vectors a little easier. There have been some concerns and evidence, uh, this is most recent, that overexpression, uh, having MACP2 with the AB9 vectors that are being used will, might cause um, liver problems, liver toxicity. But we, but Novartis has um, indicated that they are pushing forward with clinical development for a gene therapy in Rett syndrome. And a new company called Tasha has also announced that they are going to uh, approach this too. There are a number of other uh, ways such as uh, to get MECP2 activity back, such as X chromosome reactivation and turning on the um, good copy of the gene, doing DNA editing using CRISPR-Cas technology, or RNA editing using ADAR or other CRISPR or other methods um, to try to improve, uh, get a normal expression of MACP2. My lab has been interested in trying to um, understand uh, or look at the ability of looking at premature termination codon read-through. So 30 to 45% of people with Rett syndrome have these nonsense mutations, which um, cause a, a premature termination codon. And it's been known that things like aminoglycosides will allow that stalled ribosome on the premature termination, termination codon to add a cognate tRNA and produce a full-length polypeptide. So Peter Hupka's group had shown that by using exogenous constructs uh, of MECP2 with cDNA, you could get read through with these amino glycosides. Um, and they created an R168X mutation, which is one of the common nonsense mutations. They could show that they could get good read through um, from fibroblasts in vitro, but they could not get in vivo read through and they did, it did not produce a truncated protein product. Similarly, we evaluated a different mouse mo model, R255X, which we also also showed that we could get inconsistent in vitro read-through and unable to get in vivo read-through. Um, and it did not produce a truncated protein product. And we wondered if the lack of this truncated protein product might be part of the reason we weren't getting read-through. So we created using CRISPR a new mouse model, the R294X, which is a late truncating model. And we showed that this on the left, you can see produces a truncated, a stable truncated protein, and both in Western and in um, immunohistochemistry from the brain. We used cells from these animals, transformed ear tip 
fibroblasts from both the R255X and the R294X and treated with G418, which is a aminoglycoside. And we showed that um, the R294X was much more sensitive. We could get much better at read through. This inspired us to try it in vitro using intraperitoneal injections. However, um, G418 does not cross the blood brain barrier, so we had to look in lung tissue, but we did see the production of full length protein. To get it into the brain, we used intracerebral and ventricular injections, and we could get read through um, and get full length protein. The problem is that G418 is very toxic, uh, especially when injected in the brain. So we really need better compounds in order to do longer treatment and look for functional improvements in these animals. Now, this is all very exciting. We have a variety of different concepts and approaches um, to try to um, improve the features of Rett syndrome and maybe modify or even reverse the disease. But of course, then we have to do clinical trials and there's certain challenges with clinical trials. One is of course outcome measures and the other is biomarkers. So I'm gonna first talk a little bit about outcome measures. Um, specifically, I'm gonna tell you that in the current trials, two clinical outcome measures are being used. One is a caregiver reported outcome measure called the Rett Syndrome Behavior Questionnaire. And this is a rating scale. And the advantages of them is that the, it has undergone psychometric evaluation. It's simple to complete and the FDA and the EMA understand it. The downside is that it doesn't cover all the domains of interest in Rett Syndrome. And it has a relatively limited response range for items, which is only not at all sometimes and always, and not as graded as you might like to see in an outcome measure. There has been some recent published concerns about the some as, psychometric aspects and um, the relative uh, clinical differences that are needed are not really established. On the other hand, on the other side, we use a clinician-reported scale called the Clinical Global Scale of Improvement, which is a clinical clinician's global view of participants global functioning. There's two scales of severity and improvement. The improvement scale is what is really used as an outcome measure. Um, in these trials. It again is understood by the regulatory agencies. And it's important to establish the rate of reliability using disease specific anchors, which we've uh, published, and then having defined rate or training, which we've created with written vignettes and gold standard scoring. I think we could improve this by having video based vignettes. Mm. So that's what we really think that there is a shortcoming in terms of the number of well-validated uh, outcome measures. And so we use the natural history study to start developing a new outcome measure. This was based on something called the Rett syndrome behavior assessment. This is a, a 37 clinician rated um, evaluation of Rett syndrome um, that had a total score in three conceptual domains. We've been collecting this for all the time in the natural history study, but it had never been psychometrically evaluated. And initial evaluation showed that it didn't really um, cluster into the domains as was conceptualized. So we did a formal um, psychometric evaluation on this from the natural history study. This reduced it down to 21 items and five factors, and you see it covers a variety of domains important in Rett syndrome. We created a revised total score, which had those 21 items plus three additional clinical and important items um, shown here. And this had a re reasonable internal consistency, and the factors correlated well with the parent re reports of clinical domain, so it showed some degree of validity. Um, we showed that this uh, correlates with age and importantly correlates with another measure of clinical severity, the clinical severity scale that we use extensively. It also showed a genotype-phenotype relationship as shown on the bottom left with the more severe mutations having a higher or more severe um, MBA score. And it also correlated nicely in a stepwise fashion with increasing severity on the clinical global impression scale of severity. So the next step now is really to use that longitudinal data that we have from the natural history study to create growth curves, especially by um, different mutations. Um, we're working to establish the reliability by doing video-based assessments to do inter- and interrelated reliability. We're looking at ex more external validity and really formally establishing the sensitivity and responsivity so we can get the minimally included clinically important differences, and developing this video-based rater training reliability platform. Now, this has all been done for a clinician-rated score, but I think we can do a similar process for a caregiver-reported outcome measure based on this natural history study information. 
So in the final bit, I'd like to talk about the use of bio, uh, the development uh, and importance of biomarkers. So biomarkers can do a number of things such as disease severity, but in clinical trials, what you'd really like is a biomarker that can identify treatment responders or be an early treatment response biomarker. That would improve the way we can do clinical trials. Now, one of the ways that people have been very interested in neurodevelopmental disorders and other neurological disorders is using neurophysiological biomarkers, which can be uh, conducted non-invasively with EEGs. And, it's, and one of the ways is doing what's called an evoked potential. And in this case, you have a flashing grid of light and you record from the EEG the brain response. And by averaging over many trials, you can get what's seen on the bottom, a, a grand average response um, pattern. And people have shown that you can find differences in Rett syndrome um, from a variety of these neurophysiological features, and these were all done at single sites. In the natural history study, then, we did it over multiple sites, um, and we looked at visual evoked potentials and then auditory evoked potentials, which was a click of sound. And as you can see on the left, the people with RET, which are shown in blue, have a different um, pattern of that response compared to typically developing in RED. Um, and specifically, they have a decreased amplitude of those uh, peak responses. We showed that this correlated both the visual evoked potentials and the auditory evoked both potentials with a with severity, and we did a repeat on a subset of the people one year later. And on the left, you can see the traces from individuals in one-year intervals, and you can see that they overlay pretty well, especially for the auditory book potentials. And all the graphs on the right are just showing the more um, quantitative assessment using interclass correlation coefficients of the different features of them. And it, um, both of both of the EPs and the AEPs showed uh, good um, uh, consistency. It was probably a little better in the auditory evoked potentials. My lab has explored using these auditory evoked potentials in these female red mice, um, and we showed that they also have the same kind of pattern where they have a decreased amplitude and actually increased latency of these peak responses. And that at the top is all at older ages, so if you look at the bottom left with D, at the older ages we see this big difference in the amplitude, but at the younger ages, at five weeks of life, we didn't really see a difference. So this is sort of in the pre-symptomatic stage, so it looks like there's a progression. We showed that this um, amplitude difference correlated with phenotypic score severity as using the bird score, and we show that it also correlated with epileptiform discharges in these mice brains. So the next steps on this is to try to get more longitudinal evoke potential data from people with Rett syndrome, and to also explore different neurophysiological features such as EEG power and coherence. Um, we also um, want to collect longitudinally in the mice these neurophysiological features and correlate that with the disease progression in the mice. And then, of course, do the kind of work that Adrian Bird pioneered of turning the gene back on so we can measure the EEG features before and after and look at it correlating with clinical severity improvement, clinical improvement in the mice. Finally, I'm going to use the last little bit of time talking about trying to do bot molecular biomarkers, work we've done in the natural history study, where we've taken sibling pairs of people with Rett syndrome and unaffected age and gender matched siblings and done an unbiased uh, metabolomics uh, evaluation. And you can see on the left this volcano plot, and I hope it's clearer on your screen than it is on mine, um, a variety of metabolites that were different between people with Rett syndrome. On the left in red, uh, the ones that were decreased in the people with Rett syndrome, and on the right and green, the people things that were increased with people with Rett syndrome. If you look at those ones that were decreased significantly on the far left, some of them like theobromine and caffeine are, um, are caffeine metabolites. So shown on the right um, uh, with a pathway analysis, um, there you have caffeine, which is true, but not very interesting because that really just reflects that people with Rett syndrome don't drink coffee. But you can see that there's also a number of other uh, pathways which are primarily in amino acids and nitrogen. And so that this seems to be interesting. And when we start diving into the different um, pathways and looking at the differences, we start seeing path patterns. So for example, on the bottom left, um, the methionine and cysteine metabolism, you see a, a pattern that looks like oxidative stress with increased cysteine and decreased methionine um, and uh, increased amount of uh, ketones. 
Furthermore, we see increased levels of unusual metabolites such as C-glycosyl tryptophan, which is shown to be associated with aging, and alterations in a variety of metabolites that are associated with gut microflora changes. So the next step is to continue the evaluation of this and in people with Rett syndrome comparing to overall severity and specific clinical problems, and also characterize these metabolites in MECB2 mutant mice. Um, and I'm working with Rodney Samako at Miller College of Medicine to do this. So uh, just my closing remarks, I'm a little over time. I'm just at time, so I hope I gave you the idea that Rett syndrome is this genetic neurodevelopmental disorder with the characteristics of progression. The mouse models are really great, and they show the ability to reverse the phenotype and uh, for opportunities for preclinical testing. And there are clinical trials underway, but we really need to improve the outcome measures and get biomarkers. So finally, I just want to thank the people in the RET Consortium who have um, really done all this work with the Natural History Study. I especially want to call out um, Alan Percy um, up in, the, in that picture. He's in the back across from me when I was much younger. Uh, and Dan Glaze, who really taught these two, uh, taught me about the clinical features of RET syndrome and really initiated the clinical trial. This was a, a time we had dinner with Bank Hogberg, um, uh, who was a seminal figure from Sweden in RET syndrome. And of course, I have to thank Huda, who really is the person who got me involved in uh, Rett syndrome research um, and really taught me about how I needed to do that. And finally, I just want to thank um, all the families and individuals with Rett syndrome who have taught me about this disorder. And I'll stop now. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey, for a really wonderful talk and a beautiful overview of, uh, of the natural history of this disorder and all the amazing work you've done. Okay, so we have uh, quite a few questions coming in now. And uh, so I'll, I'll kick off with the, uh, the one at the top of the list. Um, okay, so this is from Vanessa Hall. And she asks, given there are several different approaches that can be used to clinically treat Rett syndrome, what do you personally believe to be the current best strategy that may give the best efficacy and safety? Oh, that, well, that's a <laughs> simple question. No, that's, a, that's, a, that's a trick one. Uh, that's a tricky one. I mean, of course, our current approaches to therapy are entirely symptomatic, and um, we have no particular evidence of one therapy being better than the other. Now, what we're doing now is clinical trials, and we're you know, hopeful that some of the clinical trials that are ongoing will show um, positive results and be effective in um, improving or modifying the disease course. Of course, you know, I think getting to the core functional problem of not having the gene will be really an important um, approach. And uh, you know, thinking about the various um, ideas that people are doing preclinically, um, there's a lot of different ideas and there's a lot of different pluses and minuses to all of them. And I think we're going to just really have to carefully explore how to um, preclinically um, what would be the best way. So I, I don't know if I answered the question as much as just talked about it. <laughs> I think I uh, um, excellent hedging. And uh, yes, I think we all we all watch with bated breath, really. Um, OK, so uh, the next question is from Anne-Marie Bisgard. And she says, thank you for a great talk and overview. Um, parents and families have high expectations for research and development of curative treatment. Do you have an impression of whether their expectations have changed over the last decade? Well, it definitely changed a lot um, with, with uh, the work by Adrian when you showed that it was reversible. That really changed the course of this field. And I think not only for Rett syndrome, I mean, that really changed the course for neurodevelopmental disorders in general, that they, this provided a hope that um, at least some of them could be reversed. And so it really has changed how both the clinicians, the scientists, and the families think about and what they expect. Um, now, you know, it has been a while since Adrian did that work. And I think people, you know, of course, have great expectations, especially with families, and like to see that happen quickly. Um, and the pace of the way science and clinical development just happens and occurs can be frustrating, I think, for families. And so I do think families are a little bit frustrated at this point. Okay. Um, so we then have a question from Giovanna Kovacevic uh, saying, regarding the broad clinical picture of patients, we do expect that one biomarker can predict the treatment efficacy in different aspects of the disease. Or what do you think about combinations of different biomarkers in order to better predict drug effect? 
Yeah, no, it's an excellent question. Um, you know, I think we would be we would love to be at the point of thinking about combining biomarkers. I think that the first point is we have to find biomarkers. Like we have to find them and show that they have um, some degree of correlation with severity. They show, um, and especially show an improvement with improvement. Um, and then yes, we might be able to combine things like measuring autonomic dysfunction and EEG function and um, maybe molecular features. And if, so if we had enough, we could probably think about bringing them together as a broader sort of combined biomarker. But I think we're at a point of really discovery um, and validation at this point. I guess following on from that, I kind of have a quick uh, question, which is, has anyone managed to uh, look at the reversibility of any biomarkers in the RET syndrome mice? Is that Has that been done yet? Uh, not for ones you talked about, but. No, no, no. That's exactly what, what I'm saying. My lab is trying to do with those those EEG and even the, um, trying to find the molecular biomarkers that we see in people in the mice and then doing those reversibility experiments and showing that it can improve. That's what I think is a very clear pathway to show what would be the best promise for the kind of biomarker we want to see, which would be one that um, precedes the that improves in a way that precedes the clinical improvement, because that would be the most useful in a clinical trial. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and then we have a last question from Rajivan Thapurakal. Uh, great talk. Thanks. Do you think it is a good idea to generate a connecto model of ret mouse slash rat and understand changes in the wiring properties at subcellular level? Uh, would it be useful to run simulations, for example, for drug studies? Is there anyone working on such things? Yeah, I mean that's <laughs> that's a big, big, uh, big project there. But I mean, I think that especially because you know we don't we don't see real gross abnormalities and sort of how the brain is wired up. But I think what you know some of the talks like we heard yesterday and other a lot of other people have been doing work on this. We see smaller level circuit level changes. So and I think people are systematically trying to understand those uh, circuit level changes. Um, and understand then how that connects with um, the clinical features and progression. And I think that's a great opportunity too, when you think about intersecting with biomarkers, especially these neurophysiological biomarkers, to understand what is the actual circuit basis of what you might be seeing um, in the biomarker, because then that actually connects down to the circuit level and to the cellular level between the larger scale EEG level. So I guess uh, we've got a couple more minutes. So um, maybe I could just ask you quickly, you kind of touched quite briefly on the gene therapy trials that are kind of being planned. Um, do you have any insight into the strategies they're using or, you know, what the evidence is so far that, um, they may, you know, they may be of work and, and the, the kind of the potential problems that, that you know, you might predict? Well, like I said, there is some um, evidence uh, from these animal models, from, from mouse models of it, um, the various uh, AV vectors being able to um, reverse features in the in mice. Uh, most of it has been done in male mice, um, which again, is not really the true model. And most of the endpoints are based on survival, which is not really the issue in the female mice or in, in, in people with Rett syndrome. And so um, I think that it's really going to be important to show that you can get this reversal um, in female mice, but also not the overshoot. And this has been a fundamental problem because um, not many people have really done these studies in a way that they're studying um, what you might see in a duplication. So we know from duplication mice, they have a specific clinical problem, phenotypes. Um, and that's not what really is being assessed when they do these kind of studies. So I think there's a little bit of a gap there. I think some of the issues obviously is getting that technological ability to get it to the right place and get high degree of efficiency of infection of the um, neurons, um, but also not being expressed in the places that you don't want it. There's clear evidence that ex overexpression of MECB2 in the uh, liver is toxic. And so ways to sort of not um, infect or decrease the MECP2 expression in the liver. And finally, you know, we don't want to 
again, this whole issue of how do you not overshoot? What is the boundary? What is the minimal amount that you need to see the improvement, but you are not going to overshoot in some of the other cells, right? Um, and I think these are critical issues that I'm hoping people are working on when they're doing this uh, clinical development. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, and thank you, Jeffrey, for, you know, great talk and, and great answers to questions. Okay. So I think we can now move on to our flash talks. Um, so we've got uh, three uh, short talks from uh, some talented uh, junior researchers. Um, and we're going to kick off with Alan Bayat. Um, sorry, wait. Yeah. Alan Bayat, who is from the University of Southern Denmark. And he is going to tell us about genetic testing in childhood epilepsy. So over to you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for the very nice introduction. Uh, my name is Alan. I'm a pediatric um, neurologist and a PhD student at the Danish Epilepsy Center. Um, thank you very much for the organizing committee to, uh, to giving me the chance to talk to you today. Um, the, the title of my talk is on genetic testing and how it affects the availability of tailored treatments. So these are my, mm, mm, yes, let's go on. So the Danish Epilepsy Center is the only tertiary hospital in Denmark, and it's specialized in the treatment of epilepsy. We treat a lot of patients annually uh, in an outpatient setting, both children and adults, and we have a well-established in-house pipeline for genetic testing of these patients. So just to let you know that genetic testing enables us to offer tailored treatment based on the cause of the disease. Uh, it also gives us the chance to repurpose some drugs with specific actions that are used for entirely unrelated conditions. And um, it also helps us to avoid drugs that could potentially exacerbate the disease. So the aim of my study was to assess the distribution of uh, monogenic epilepsies and accordingly adjusted medical treatment in a center like ours. So this study was initiated back in 2015, and all children uh, born between 2006 and 11 were um, and followed at our center in 2015 were potentially eligible for this study. And I'll show you the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So you can see inclusion criteria was that they had to have epilepsy. Um, some of them had prolonged and clustering uh, febrile seizures to start with. We also included them because sometimes epilepsy may be preceded by febrile seizures. We excluded patients that did not have epilepsy. Uh, and some had tics or uh, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. And we also included patients that did have epilepsy, but we thought that a non-genetic etiology could explain the seizures, which could be, for example, neonatal stroke. So we ended up with 358 patients uh, followed in 2015. Seven of them did not have epilepsy, and not seven, seven percent, sorry. And 11 percent had a non-genetic etiology. So it left us with 290 patients. We uh, approached them, and some of them did not consent for further genetic testing. So we ended up finally with 203 patients, which was the study cohort. Most of these patients had what we call a DE, a developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. Some had focal or multifocal epilepsy, and a few had generalized uh, seizures. So at time of inclusion, um, almost 90% of patients had already been uh, genetic tested either by us or by the referred hospitals and testing were commonly done by uh, gene panels or sample sequencing of specific genes such as TSC1, TSC2 or by microarray. So um, this had already given us a, di a, di a genetic diagnosis in 45%. So we have 55% that were genetically undiagnosed and we offer them an in-house exome. Um, and let, this led us to further diagnosis in, in 12%, so 13 out of the 110 unsolved uh, cases. And we found a few known uh, diseases, disease genes, but also a few candidate genes. Thus, in conclusion, uh, almost 48% is half of the cohort um, reached a genetic diagnosis across 38 genes. And here you can see the most common uh, genes we found, and most of them are sodium channel disorders, and a few was uh, due to TSC1 and TSC2. 
Here you can see the diagnostic yield based on the child's age at the first seizure. So in, in the two lines above, you can see if the child was younger than two years of age when he or she had his first seizures, the diagnostic yield was about 60 to 70 percent, whereas it felt when you came uh, older than two years. And this shows if you had, for example, severe syndromes such as uh, Dravet syndrome or epileptic spasms, the diagnostic yield was also very, very high. Here on the left, you can see that half of our patients had a genetic diagnosis, most due to SNVs, a few due to CNVs. And on the right, you can see that half of those with a genetic diagnosis, we could actually uh, offer them tailored treatment. So this 25% of our patients. So this is the final um, slide. So 50% reached a genetic diagnosis. 38 genes were involved. Most of them were sodium channel disorders. The diagnostic yield was highest in patients with seizures before two years of age. NGS approaches were, uh, gave us a higher diagnostic yield than array. NGS approaches we feel uh, should uh, be considered as the first choice uh, um, in epilepsy patients when you want to do um, genetic testing. Um, of course, um, exome sequencing also helps us to find genes that are missed by panels uh, and potentially you can find new candidate genes. So in conclusion, precision medicine um, is available for 25% of patients seen at the tertiary, tertiary, tertiary hospitals. But of course, we still need to find new uh, treatment approaches for these patients. Thank you. Um, okay, so cracking on then, uh, third up, we have uh, Rika hahn Kofid from the Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center in Canada. And she is gonna tell us about non-invasive gene delivery to the brain. Off you go. Thank you very much. So today I'm going to talk about how we can achieve a non-invasive gene delivery to the brain using transcranial focused ultrasound, which allows intravenous adeno-associated virus to cross the blood-brain barrier. Okay, this is a little slow. Um, we are combining low-intensity focused ultrasound with intravenously injected microbubbles, which have been used for decades as an ultrasound contrast agent. The microbubbles are injected intravenously, uh, here shown in red, and they enter the bloodstream of the brain, where we apply focused ultrasound to brain regions of interest. This induces an oscillation of the microbubbles, which increases the permeability of the blood-brain barrier and allows substances in the blood, here shown in purple, to enter into the brain. We've used this method to deliver a range of different substances, and today I'm going to focus on the delivery of gene therapy. We have conducted a comprehensive study delivering six different AAV serotypes together with the microbubbles through an intravenous tail vein injection and applied ultrasound to the brain. We have used MRI guidance to specifically target the cortex, the striatum, the thalamus, and the hippocampus. This study was conducted to establish the standards of focused ultrasound-mediated brain delivery of AAVs. Of note, the AAVRG stands for AAV retrograde, which is the modified AAV2 variant that I'm going to go more into details with later on. So here you see the results from this study. And in yellow, you see the protein encoded in the AAVs. As you can see, we achieve a very specific delivery of the AAV to the targeted regions. And we also see a difference in delivery efficiency across AAV serotypes. We have quantified the number of neurons that were transduced compared to the total number of neurons in each of the one millimeter diameter focused ultrasound spots. As you can see, in most brain regions, AAV9 led to a significantly higher neuronal transduction compared to the other AAV serotypes, followed by AAV8 and AAV9, um, AAV1. We have also quantified the area that was transduced, as you can see in the upper right corner now, and we found that in the cortex and in the hippocampus, except for AAB5, most serotypes transduced an area of the same size. However, in the thalamus and to some extent in the striatum, AAB9 transduced a larger area compared to the other serotypes. This suggests that the um, size of the transduced area depends both on the AAB serotype, but also on the properties of the targeted brain region. As you can see, AAV5 generally performs the poorest in the brain data. However, when we were looking in the periphery, we found a very high distribution of AAV5 to a number of peripheral organs. This suggests that, not surprisingly, does the ability of focused ultrasound to deliver AAVs to the brain 
depend on the distribution of the AEVs and likely especially their distribution to the brain vasculature. Now to go a little bit back to the modified AEV, um, the AEV retrograde was developed in the lab of Dr. Kapova at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And here in the original publication, you see an intracranial injection into the basal ponti nucleus, which, le which led to a retrograde transport and transduction of cortical regions. We have delivered the AEV2RG uh, with focused ultrasound targeting the striatum bilaterally. As you can see here in white, we get transduction in the actual ultrasound spots, but we also see transduction in a number of cortical regions. This suggests that by, that by using AAV retrograde, we can transduce a number of different brain regions simultaneously when we strategically apply focused ultrasound to well-connected brain regions. We've also delivered another modified AAV2 called AAV2-HPKO, which was developed at Sanofi. The modifications of this virus allows it to travel further in the brain tissue before it is taken up into the cells, which results in transduction of a larger brain area compared to the parental AV2. As part of a Sanofi Eye Awards project, we have delivered the AV2 HPKO using a bilateral targeting of, with focused ultrasound of the thalamus. This led to a dramatic 21% transduction of all of the neurons in the thalamus. And of note, we actually only targeted 30% of the thalamus with focused ultrasound. Now, this suggests that we can transduce a large brain area when combining the AV2-HPKO with the focused ultrasound while only targeting the ultrasound to a minor part of this brain area. This is especially important for the translation of just gene delivery strategy to larger brains. And finally, I would just like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Isabella Bayer, as well as the lab members who have been working together with me on these projects. I'd also like to thank our collaborators at Sanofi, as well as my funding agencies, and you for your attention. Thank you very much, Rika. Um, so we've just got time now for a, a couple of questions, and um, we've got a few in the chat, so I'll just kick off with those. Um, firstly, for Alan from Anne-Marie Bisgard. She says, thanks, Alan, for sharing interesting and important work with us. Can you elaborate on how often the results led to a known developmental syndrome that was not suspected before entering the study? Yeah, yes. Um, yes, I can. Uh, I, yeah, I just can't give you a short answer. Um, if we look at all... <laughs> Sorry. If, sure. if we look at all patients, <laughs> yeah, I, I will try. If we look at all patients, so large studies of patients with monogenic uh, epilepsies, we know that about 70% of these patients can be solved by only seven different genes. However, the, the, the rest of these patients are divided across more than hundreds of genes. Uh, just in most, um, so um, this was the background. So in our study, uh, all of the patients um, underwent some kind of uh, panel testing before we did the exomes in the unsolved. Um, and um, in, in, in about 12% of the patients where we didn't pick up anything in these, uh, in these, um, um, in these uh, panels, we were able to find a genetic explanation. So it's it's been about twelve percent of the of the unknown patients where we could find something that was what well, that was known uh, to cause a genetic disorder. Um, so it's it's basically explained by these genes not being in the panels. That was a long explanation. I don't know if that made sense. <laughs> I think that made so, sense. And Maria, Thank you. It, it's, it's about it's about ten percent extra that we get out of an exome uh, after doing uh, these panels. Thank you. Okay, so um, we've got a, a question for Rika, um, a, a night from Prakash Devaraju. A naive question: What are the bubbles made of? And I'll add my naive question, which is: um, Does the ultrasound have to go through the intact skull, or do you have to um, do something to get it in? So uh, I can answer the first one very quickly. It goes through the intact skull. Um, so there, we just have to remove the hair. That's the only thing. Uh, the microbubbles are uh, gas-filled lipid vesicles, um, but it really just is an ultrasound contrast agent. So there's nothing really new about that part of it. It's not a new type of bubble. Uh, we use the type called Definity, which is just a commercial type of ultrasound contrast agent. 
Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and uh, we've got a question for Sydney, uh, for Martin. Great talk, Sydney. Uh, could you speculate on the synaptic or circuit mechanisms that might account for the reduced functional connectivity under Baclofen challenge? Oh, God. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily want to speculate on that. I, I, it's, it, it becomes... It becomes super complicated because we're, it's, we're kind of taking a sledgehammer to the inhibitory system right so I, I guess any any synaptic deficit that could uh that that could potentially any synaptic deficit you could be enhancing or amplifying the the network level connectivity by modifying that local area of cortex so i i don't think it necessarily speak i guess the whole point of the the study is to try to look at how these diverse molecular pathologies can converge into just, you know, into excitatory and inhibitory balance. So no, Thanks. I'm not um, gonna... <laughs> okay, you're not going to speculate. Very wise, very wise. Um, so just very quickly, Rika, um, last question from Carol Schurmans. Uh, nice talk. Which disorders do you see this technology useful for? What about stroke with vascular defects? Uh, yes, so it could definitely be used for, for stroke, uh, especially because we are able to get this very specific delivery. So we could deliver it specifically to the stroke area. Um, it could also be used for uh, other diseases that have a more widespread uh, disease. Uh, like I showed, if we combine it with uh, AEV serotypes that have special properties, we can really utilize either having it in multiple brain regions uh, or uh, having um, a larger brain region, but still like specifically targeted, like I showed with the, the thalamus. Um, so it can be used for a number of different diseases. Uh, because we do an intravenous injection of the AEV, it also has potential for diseases where you need to correct something both in the periphery as well as in the brain. So we can kind of achieve the delivery to, to both sides at the same time. Um, and of note, the dosages that we use of AEV are much lower than what are, current, what are currently used in the clinic to cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, so in terms of detargeting from the liver, for instance, we are also able to achieve this better than um, when you currently have to go to these really high dosages to get it to cross into the brain. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, thanks to all our speakers again for giving great short talks. Um, we're now going to move on to the next uh, 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 major talk. And um, so it's with enormous pleasure that I can introduce Huda Zogby, uh, who's from the Baylor College of Medicine. And she is going to tell us today about epigenetics and brain plasticity, lessons from Rett syndrome and other METP2 disorders. Off you go. Thank you, Huda. Thank you, Laura. I'm deeply honored to receive this uh, recognition from the Lundbeck Foundation and the wonderful Brain Prize and to share it with Adrian Bird. I'm also grateful that this is a beautiful recognition for all the trainees who labored to help us understand this disorder and the patient who inspire us. So my journey with Rett syndrome started with an encounter with this beautiful girl in 1983. I was struck by her story because she started life healthy. You see her here leafing through a book, perfectly uh, using her hands, and up to two years of age, doing everything that a healthy girl would do. See her here running on a rocking horse, and she was able to speak and say a few words. And all of that changed after the age of two years, and she couldn't use her hands anymore. You see her here wringing her hands. It, it was really a striking uh, course, and I met her the same month that Ben Hagbert wrote his beautiful paper about the cases from Europe and named the syndrome after Andreas Rett, who noted the syndrome in the 60s. And it was really a chance encounter a week later with a patient with cerebral palsy who walked into the my neurology fellowship clinic uh, a fellow clinic and was wringing her hand and I also recognized in her the symptoms of Rett syndrome and having seen two within a week when no one else in the United States has really reported on any such patients, uh, I decided to look 
work with the within the clinic for additional cases and with the help of clinic volunteers I identified six patients that together with my colleagues uh, and attending physicians uh, Alan Percy Dangley's and Vince Riccardi and uh, collaborator Ian Butler we studied extensively and as clinicians we couldn't do as much but we did measure biogenic amines and noticed that the metabolites of dopamine and serotonin were decreased in the spinal fluid and reported in this. And I would say it was really that report that resulted in sending us a lot of patients with red syndrome, and I got to see so many of them, and I was immediately really hooked on wanting to study this disorder and understand its molecular and genetic basis. I was convinced there has to be a gene causing this disease because of the similarity. It's almost like a program. And the passion to move from clinical neurology to science was to understand it because it's neither a developmental disorder. They start life as normal and it's neither a degenerative disorder. They can live with this disease uh, for decades. Uh, the challenge, of course, back then, uh, we didn't have the technology to find a gene for a sporadic disease, but the fact they were all females uh, was convincing to me enough that this maybe is on the X chromosome. And in fact, it took us years to find some precious uh, families that helped us. And in this case, in this particular family, you'll see that the mother is healthy, but she has two daughters with different spouses, which tell us it's probably the mother that passed on the gene, having red syndrome, the two daughters. So I was able to find non-random X chromosome inactivation in the mother, which gave me the final clue, this really must be on the X, and started mapping regions that are shared in the sisters. And that helped us narrow it down to one third of the X chromosome and with work with, with the front of, uh, Frank and narrowed it down, and Carolyn Shannon, we narrowed it down further, and it then just became brute force effort, sequence gene after gene, until Ruthie Emir, with her tenacity after three years of sequencing, identified mutations in methyl CPG binding protein 2, which, of course, Adrian has discovered earlier in the 90s. And you've, you've heard a beautiful description from Jeff, so I will not focus on the clinical phenotype. I just want to highlight the panel on the right where uh, males with milder mutations um, will have learning disabilities, but any one of these features. We've seen males now that have psychiatric features. So just want to highlight that really mild mutations in this gene can cause autism as well as psychiatric phenotypes. Uh, and uh, we began our studies, sorry, the clicker, uh, by looking into mouse models first, adding the healthy gene, adding the human gene using its own control elements. And to our surprise, Anne Collins, when she did this experiment, she found that doubling the levels of the MECP2 protein causes a progressive neurological disorders in the mice that had many features of all domains affected actually in red syndrome and, and premature lethality. And that led us to suspect that there may be humans with duplications spanning this gene. And Hilde Van Esch uh, indeed found uh, reported on such Sorry, this uh, clicker. I am not able to move the, cl the clicker. Okay, now, so um, going back. Uh, Hilda Vanesh described patients with this uh, disorder where they have duplications spanning the MACP2 gene, and these are boys, and had all the features of, uh, of the, the scene in the mouse. So this, again, highlights what Adrian and Jeff just noted, that the mouse models are really excellent for this class of disorders. And to date, we know that this protein is highly sensitive to changes in it activity and levels. You see here 100% is what uh, is essential for health. Doubling it or tripling it is even more severe. And then gradation of loss of function will cause phenotype from mild to severe. So this is why we actually refer to it as a Goldilocks protein. 
And what we learned is having too much of the protein really just causes a gain of function of the normal function. So on this slide, you see, for example, in the null animals, you see decreased excitatory synapses, whereas in the duplication animals, you see increase in those synapses. Similarly, molecularly, the gene expression changes are the inverse. So my slacking the gene will have, for example, decreased gene expression. Some of the same genes will be increased in the duplication. More recently, um, we've learned uh, about a new methyl mark, and Adrian uh, referred to this in his studies. This mark was discovered by Joe Ecker and Mark Garrens in 2013, and the labs of Hong Jung Song and uh, Mike Greenberg showed that the DMT3A is the writer of this mark in the brain. So we were interested to learn what's the contribution of this mark to red pathology. And to do this, uh, Laura Lavery, postdoc in the lab, compared the loss of function of DNMT3A and MACP2 in the same neurons and, and the, on the same genetic background, these are inhibitory neurons, and compare that at many levels, behavior, physiology, and molecular. And we'll just summarize her data briefly to tell you that there's uh, enormous overlap in the phenotype. So clearly this mark uh, contributes to red pathogenesis, but the DNMT3A loss is more severe, causes earlier lethality, and there are few behaviors that were seen only in the MACP2 knockout. And if we were to look molecularly, when Laura isolated striatal inhibitory neurons and interrogated the gene expression, she found that there are about 86 genes that go in both directions that are precisely altered and in the same directions in, most, in both mutants. And what's notable is that those genes represent about 40% of the genes altered in the MACP2 knockout mice which tells us that this mark is a major or contributes significantly to the pathogenesis of Rett syndrome, but perhaps not all the changes. What's also notable is that only 12% uh, these genes represent about only 12% of the genes changed in the DNMT3A knockout, telling us that perhaps there may be other readers uh, because it's not as much... Uh, 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 overlap with the red syndrome uh, changes. And Laura is pursuing now strategies to study that in her own lab. So with that, I'd like now to move about what we've learned about the importance of this protein in various neurons. So you see in the middle, the uh, constellation of red syndrome phenotype. It really affects all parts of the nervous system, central, peripheral, and autonomic. And what we did, we used mice to delete the gene in specific neurons and regions to learn which symptoms might evolve from which particular neurons. And we learned quite a bit about that. And I would say, in general, this protein is essential for the function of almost all neurons. Maybe the cerebellar neurons are more resistant. We just recently published on that, but otherwise it's essential for the function of all. And what's interesting is that in every case, it partially disables these neurons. It makes these neurons function at about 70% of their normal capacity. And that's enough to produce the phenotype you see. And we know that from measuring their neurotransmitter transmitters and uh, peptides, as well as measuring their synaptic activity and function. So with that knowledge, knowing that so many genes are altered, all neurons are affected, what can one do? One of the first things we contemplated is perhaps try to activate these neurons, try to stimulate them. And to this end, we collaborated with General Tang and his postdoc, Shuang Hao, to, to try something used in the clinic, D-brain stimulation. And in this case, pick the fornix, which can activate the hippocampus if it's stimulated, as you can see by this recording in the dentate gyrus after stimulating the fornix, and ask, would that improve learning and memory phenotype, hippocampal learning and memory phenotype? And this was done in mature female mice after they developed learning and memory symptoms at about nine to 10 weeks of age. They received one hour of stimulation a day 
and then they were evaluated about four weeks, four to five weeks after that for the multitude hippocampal phenotypes that are altered in them, behavior, physiology, neurogenesis, and gene expression changes. And since this is published, I will just summarize the data and share with you that all hippocampal learning phenotype improved, the plasticity, in vivo plasticity normalized, and the uh, synchrony normalized, increased adult neurogenesis, and gene expression also changed. So this was quite exciting, and it told us that the red brain, at least in mice, is responsive to the brain stimulation. Of course, I shared with you there are multiple phenotypes in Rett syndrome, and being able to modify all these, it's going to require a lot of invasiveness using deep brain stimulation. But it gave us the idea that boosting the activity, somehow stimulating neurons can help them. So we thought long and hard, if there is a way we can mimic that maybe in a less invasive way. And this is a new story I'd like to share with you that was performed by my graduate student, Nat Achille. We asked if intensive behavioral training could enhance circuit activity to improve red phenotype. And aware that many patients undergo training after symptoms, we wanted to see if the time of training will make a difference. So to this end, Nate initially focused on a motor phenotype that we know is impaired in, in the mice, which is their ability to stay on a rotating rotor rod. This is a very robust phenotype in the mice. And what we know is that this phenotype develops at 12 weeks of age. And we know that by 24 weeks, they do very poorly. So we asked, what would happen if we do this training when they are symptomatic, but add now another 14 days of training to the routine rotorot training. So this is 18 days of training. Versus if we do this before the animals are symptomatic and do this every other week, just twice a week, but every other week. So now we're doing the exact same days of training, but those days are starting much earlier before any symptom onset. And the results were really quite stunning. You'll see on, on this graph that wild-type mice can stay about 200 seconds on the rotating rod, whereas red mice, typical untrained, do very poorly. If we do the late training, we did see some benefit, but it wasn't as strong as we did when we saw early training. And you'll see in the early training, they performed almost as good as a wild-type animal. And as we followed these mice, it clearly delayed the course, course of the uh, disease by months, three months to four months. So then we asked, how about other phenotypes? Those animals on the rod did not do well better in behavioral, other behavior. So we wanted to ask if other domains will benefit from such training. So we focus now on a totally different domain, learning and memory, hippocampal learning and memory, in this case using the Morris Water Maze to see if we can intensely train these animals, they will do better. As you see in this cartoon, the animals have to find a hidden platform using cues on the wall, and wild type mice do it quickly, but the red mice unfortunately fail at that. So again, in this, disease, in this uh, behavior, the animals will be symptomatic at about six weeks of age, so the training has to start even earlier. And in this case, again, we did late training, 12 days of training now after symptoms and early training where we started at four weeks and we trained them four days a month, every month. So again, it's not horribly intense, but it is a lot more in early. And here again, we were really pleasantly surprised to see how beautifully the animals performed. You'll see in blue, the wild type mice, they quickly learn the task and find the platform but untrained, uh, late trained mice or untrained mice, the red and purple, they can't find the platform. However, in brown, you'll see that the red mice that have been early trained find it just as fast as the wild type animals. And then we take the quadrant out and see, would they search that quadrant where the platform used to be as well as wild type mice? And you'll see on this graph left panel, that wild type mice will spend the time in the right corner about 50%, whereas the naive spend 25%, which is just chance, late trained equally chance. However, the early trained now do better. 
if you move to the right panel, you'll see that crossing the right area where the platform used to be is far more successful in early trained animal, but not in the late and naive animals. So then we asked, how about other hippocampal functions? And the animals did not show improvement on another hippocampal function. So this led us to suspect that maybe it's the neurons that were trained, that it must be a task-specific neuron that changed with that training that's mediating the phenotype. So to answer this question, we have to now capture those task-specific neurons and see are they the reason the animals are improved? And to do that, we use the mouse developed by Li Chun Lu, where uh, FOS activate a Cre enzyme that will mediate rec recombination of a reporter gene, because of course, any neuron engaged in activity will express FOS. And in turn, when we give tamoxifen, this neuron that has been activated will turn red. And you'll see on this slide on the left, animals that were just handled, you don't see much uh, reporter activity, whereas when they're in the Morris water maze, those neurons engaged in the task as they're trained in swimming, you see the neurons label. So now that we can capture those neurons, we can ask how important are these task-specific neurons. We can either act, silence them or activate them, activate them using designer receptors that are exclusively activated by a designer drug in this case, clozapine and oxide, or CNO for short. And this was beautifully illustrated by Brian Roth through many, many studies. So what we did then is capture these neurons and express in them in a Cree-dependent matter, first, the silencing receptor. And we've done many controls. I'm just showing you here two examples where the animals on the top went through the intense training but just before examining them in the Morris water maze, we gave them the CNO. These ones don't express the receptor, they just express M. cherry. But on the bottom, if you express the receptor in those task activated neurons and give them CNO, what would happen? And what happened is the animals could not learn. And you'll see the data shown here. Uh, if you look at the left panel, again, wild type mice. Uh, perform very well. And you'll see here that this group of red mice perform just as good as wild type mice with that in a training uh, with a, an only M. cherry. But when the silencing receptor is activated to silence these neurons, the animals went back to chance. Of course, the wild type animals can learn it again because they recruit new task specific neurons. And then on the right, you see that the platform crossing is lost when you silence those activity uh, active task specific neurons. Then we asked what would happen if we stimulate them. And in this task, what we did, we put the animals just one time, one set, uh, one set of session in the pool without the extra training. So they would be very similar to naive mice. But instead of stimulating the neuron by the extra training, we took them back to their home cage. In a group of them, we expressed the activating receptor and gave them CNO. So now instead of training, you identify the task specific neuron from one session of swimming, and then you activate them with the CNO. And in this case, what we discovered is that activating those neurons actually results in great performance. So on the left, you'll see the wild type and the mutant mice. They don't do well without any training, even wild type, they have to be trained some on that task. But after activating the task specific neuron that we capture after that one session in the pool, if you now uh, train them, they can now find the uh, uh, quadrant with the platform and cross the platform area very well. So these results really showed us that it is those task specific neurons that are important. So I'd like to summarize for you what we learned from these studies. We learned that pre-symptomatic training improves both motor and memory deficit. These are the two different domains we tested, but in a task-specific manner. And that this continued training delays the onset of the phenotype. I didn't have time to show these data. 
What's important is we learn that there are task-specific neurons that mediate the benefit. So one has to train specifically on a task to see a benefit. And lastly, I didn't have time to show you that. What's really nice is that we discovered that these uh, this pre-symptomatic training improved the function of the neuron, increased their excitatory responses, improve their synapse number and dendritic arborization. So clearly this training is changing the physiology of the neuron, which eventually results in better behavior. And we think this is important and has clinical implications. On this graph, I'm showing you the typical course of a girl with Rett syndrome. They usually do very well till about 12 months and slowly we begin to see a regression after 12 to 18 months. Most girls are diagnosed by three years of age. So we are losing precious time before knowing that these girls could perhaps be put through training. And maybe if we had newborn screening and we perform task-specific training, and as you saw, it doesn't have to be every day. You can do different tasks on different day. It's a different way of training, and we can discuss that later. Might we change the trajectory of Fred syndrome? delay the onset of disease, make them better responsive to therapy, and hopefully uh, until additional therapies uh, get along, do much better. So we're thinking about all these considerations now. In the last couple of minutes, I'd just like to share with you what we've done with the other disorder, the MP2 duplication, where the mouse uh, shares all the features when it has an extra human copy gene. And for this, having an extra amount of the protein, one can lower the protein to hopefully gain benefit. And we asked if normalizing the protein in adult mice will do that. And in collaboration with Ionis Pharmaceuticals, we used an antisense oligonucleotide strategy to delete the RNA from the human, deplete the RNA from the human gene, leaving the mouse gene intact. And all behaviors seen in this mouse corrected. This is just an example of activity. You'll see the gray bars showing you the transgenic behaviors. And after treatment with ASO, they're very similar to wild type animals. What's really nice, even if we start the treatment real late at seven to nine months of age, in this case, the animals have epilepsy, multiple seizures a day, abnormal EEG, all of that corrected and the EEG normalized. So to move this into the humans, we now need to worry about the other human allele. In humans, both alleles are identical. So we created a humanized mice that has two human alleles, but no mouse allele, and uh, showed it has the phenotypes and double the amount of protein, and asked, can one titrate the dose of the ASO so that we don't overcorrect? And you can see in this experiment that indeed one can do that and identifying the ideal dose, then we went into the mouse uh, with the humanized allele, treated them, and again, reversed their motor and uh, cognitive phenotypes. But something very interesting came from these studies. When we perform pharmacodynamic studies following the ASO and multiple uh, uh, phenotypes, this is what we learned that the RNA of MACP2 normalizes within one week after treatment, so it quickly normalizes. But you look at the bottom graph, that's the protein, it actually lags behind, it takes two weeks to normalize. So we followed all the phenotypes, molecular changes, behavior, etc., and I'll summarize it all for you here on this slide. You'll see that week one after therapy, we normalize, we decrease the RNA. Week two, we decrease the protein. Interestingly, it took five weeks for gene expression changes, some gene expression changes to normalize. And, but yet behavior did not normalize at that point. It actually took till nine weeks after ASO treatment for the behavior to normalize. And I think this is really good because it tells us we have an opportunity to give the drug, monitor uh, markers, and know that we are hitting the right range and one can always use an antidote to ASO if we overcorrect. So this really provides a proof of concept that there is a path forward, hopefully, to move in the clinic. And we are now at this very final stage of these studies, working with Ionis Pharmaceuticals to develop a biomarker that can be uh, informative at a single patient level to know you hit the right dose. 
So I'm pretty hopeful. I've shared with you that I will both threat and uh, the duplication that we have a path forward, hopefully to make a difference in the life of these individuals. And in closing, I'd like to thank all of those who contributed to the work. I mentioned as I went along uh, the contribution, I, Hezi Steinberg and Min Yao Chao did all the ASO studies in the duplication and Nate in the, uh, I mentioned the training studies and of course Ruthie always credited for her tenacity for sequencing gene after gene. I mostly want to thank the families. They have been so patient with us throughout the year, trusted in me when I uh, many decades ago said I want to find this gene and they enrolled in our study. So grateful to that and they continue to enroll in these studies and of course all of our collaborators. Thank you. Thank you very much, Huda, for an absolutely beautiful talk, an amazing story. Um, okay, we've got time for some questions, and uh, they're coming in. So although I have a few, I will, I will defer to, to the audience. Um, so first of all, we have from Bart, a super nice story. Uh, what do you think is happening uh, from a molecular perspective in these stimulated neurons? Great question, Bart. So what we're beginning to look now, uh, what, what we saw in the stimulated neurons under deep brain stimulation is many synaptic genes, many pro genes that encode synaptic proteins normalized. Essentially, 25% of the genes that normalized in the RET model were all in that category. And many of them include genes that you know are critical for neuronal function and synaptic health. And interestingly, many of them are altered in other developmental disorders. So I think the stimulation at least using deep brain stimulation can be helpful perhaps to additional disorders. But in the case of the training, we don't know yet in the task-specific neurons what's changing. In fact, the RNA on these neurons is currently being sequenced. We capture those neurons early and late before and after activity. So hopefully in the next chapter, I'll be able to tell you that. Fantastic. Thanks. Okay, so uh, next question is from Saad Omez, uh, who says, great work. Were the task-specific neurons in the hippocampus region-specific as well? Uh, for example, uh, the adult-born neurons of the dentate gyrus, might they be more susceptible, hence relatively late-onset symptoms? That's really an interesting question, uh, whether the neurons that we're seeing improving are newly born neurons. We actually think they're just the regular retinal neurons because, I mean, we cannot rule out that there is neurogenesis and that's improving. What we do believe it is the CA1 neurons that probably have been there on board that has that have improved. That's what we believe. Because eventually, if you stop the training or interrupt the training, you lose the benefit. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from Vanessa Hall. She asks, task training of patients sounds like a promising approach for the treatment of rats. If this could be translated to young patients, what are the equivalent training tasks that are applicable for humans that might improve cognition, but also motor respiratory anxiety, et cetera? Right. So I've been thinking long and hard about this. And I think that one advantage for Rett syndrome is not all the phenotype happen at the same time. Motor function is one of the first things to show up, tone, truncal function, gait. So you can think about it. Typically, we let a little infant learn to roll, learn to sit on their own pace. But I think if we knew maybe a baby has Rett syndrome, we can begin to strengthen their, their tone. We can work on their uh, core muscles to have a better tone. They can be put in training a little bit earlier, say at one year of age, to take few steps more focus on these tasks. So I can see it in multiple domains. In the domain of the language, they may be taught to say mama, dada a little bit more intensively, uh, intensely at one to one and a half year of age. Maybe they will return to retain these words longer if they had learned them a little bit with more intensive training. Uh, the use of their hand, maybe practice the use of their hand with some uh, occupational therapy. So there are many domains we can do. And as you saw, once a month, uh, twice in a row help, has helped the mice uh, 
uh, with a strong phenotype. So if we did this on alternate day, the key, it's a different kind of physical therapy. It's not the one they go and they have a few minutes of this and a few minutes of that. It's really, let's focus on a task at one period of time and maybe in the afternoon, a different task. It's a different type of training, but it might buy us a year of delay onset of disease and perhaps better performance as additional therapies are added. That's really interesting. Actually, can I just add to that? Do you know whether there's anything about the phasing, the timing of the phasing of the training that was important in terms of the e efficacy? That's a great question. As you can imagine, Laura, doing any of these studies is a, you, with all the controls, a huge amount of animals. So we picked, you know, every other week for the rotorod and once a month for the, sw the swimming. We don't know if we used fewer or more if one will get better, longer lasting, all of that could be tried. This, this is just the beginning, but we were fortunate that we saw such a strong phenotype with only these two time periods. Yeah, it's amazing. Okay, so we have a question from Anne-Marie Bisgard. Uh, she says, thank you. Do you think it is possible to have a classical RET phenotype without having uh, a MECP2 variant? Um, clinically, it is obvious that the girls with RET and a known MECP2 have a very distinct and recognizable phenotype, but the diagnostic criteria do not include the genetic diagnosis. Excellent question. Uh, as you heard from Jess, about 95 to 97% of girls with classic RET have a mutation in this gene. My suspicion is that our remaining 3 to 5% have a mutation either in an intron or in a regulatory element that severely inactivate the protein, that uh, allele, but that you know, currently we don't capture and we have not looked at. Recently, we have a paper currently in press looking at the enhancers of MACP2, and we identified some that lowered the protein level and clearly contributed to phenotype. So there may be some regulatory element mutations that are yet to, to be discovered. Thank you. Um, so I think probably, uh, unless there are any more questions um, that you want to ask quickly, um, I think that we are done. So thank you very much indeed for uh, presenting that beautiful work. Um, so I think we're now going to move to our panel discussion. Um, so maybe magically, that's why <laughs> we will all appear in our, uh, on the uh, screen. Hi, Adrian. Uh, <laughs> hi, it's okay. amazing. The power of... Uh, technology which is just about coping um so uh so this is a panel discussion and again as i i, I do encourage and invite uh, all the members of the audience to you know ask those questions you've always wanted to know um but perhaps we can uh kick off with perhaps asking each one of you in turn maybe just to tell us a bit about your background and how you ended up doing this kind of research. Um, feel free to include any fun anecdotes or stories about your journey on the way. Um, and so maybe uh, if we start with Huda and first and then go to Adrian. So my journey was set on becoming an academic child neurologist. That's what I really was trained for. And it was encountering Ashley, who you saw in the picture today and in Jeff's videos, that inspired me to really think about her disease and eventually the serendipity of seeing another girl and more girls with a disease that I decided I have to go to the lab and learn how to do molecular biology and science to find this gene. 100% inspired by patients. Never thought I would be a scientist when I started my clinical career. And if I to tell you a couple of challenging anecdote uh, along the way, as we were trying to find, narrow the region on the X chromosome, I had one family that had second half cousins with Rett syndrome. The two half cousins had Rett syndrome and the great grandmother was shared in common. I was convinced this is on the X. If we can narrow the region now, we can find the gene real quickly. The two girls shared none of the X chromosome with each other. So two half cousins shared nothing of the X and all my colleagues said, quit looking for a gene for Rett. That's it. This family tells you it's not on the X. Of course, I had the tendency to ignore some data at that stage so that I can keep looking for the genes. I ignored that piece of data. Then we had an inversion on the X, cloned the inversion, no gene in a Rett syndrome girl. Again, told 
quit. This is the wrong thing to, to be focused on. Then when we found the gene, went back to these second half cousins, they both have mutations, each different mutations. So it just happened. They both had Rett syndrome, a mutation in the methyl CPG binding protein gene, but different mutations. So lightning struck twice. With the girl with the inversion, she had Rett syndrome, but her mutation was on the normal X chromosome. So these were anecdotes to show you that sometimes in science you encounter challenges that you did not expect. And I'm glad I didn't pay attention to these two pieces of data and kept plowing to find the red gene. That's an amazing story. Um, Adrian, do you want to tell us about uh, your background and your journey and uh, any stories you'd like to My journey. add? Um, yes. I'm a, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a biochemist, trained as a biochemist, uh, and I've always been interested in genomes. And um, uh, so that's the direction I come from. It's actually rather interesting that Huda was motivated by the clinical side, and I have um, oblivious to the clinical side initially until her seminal work started working on the molecules. And uh, we're sort of groping... Uh, to try to link those two things up uh, from opposite directions, though obviously we're not the only people uh, in this in this field. Um, so I came across methyl binding proteins because I was interested in methylated DNA and um, finding, um, first of all, we, we mapped it and found that there were these holes in the methylation pattern which are called CPG islands. And so I thought, well, maybe they're there because there's something binding to those bits that exclude DNA methylation. So what we did was make uh, oligonucleotides that were either methylated or unmethylated. And that was a bit of a fuss in the 1970s, I have to say, and took about three months uh, before we got a molecule, then we modified it, etc. And instead of binding to the non-methylated one, which we thought would be explained CPG islands, we got something that bound to the methylated one and nothing that bound to the non-methylated one. And it took us an embarrassing long, long time to realize that actually that might be interesting if there were proteins that bound specifically to methylated DNA. And um, following that up, first in Edinburgh and then in Vienna, in Vienna, incidentally, at the time uh, when uh, Andreas Rett was still working there, still alive, completely unknown to us, um, we came across MECP2. And uh, we found the protein sequence uh, and um, cloned the gene and that was really our entry into this field which branched out into a clinical interest um, uh, once it became uh, known that it was a, a protein that, uh, that it was involved in, in in these disorders not just one disorder several disorders as Huda has emphasized so that's um, a sort of slightly uh, lumpy version of uh, my journey Thanks for that. It's, it's actually really interesting that um, that your backgrounds are so kind of different and complementary and have come together. It's like a the prize is kind of illustrating this, uh, uh, you know, maybe hopefully not so rare example of where you can come at things from different directions, um, but arrive, you know, somewhere together and 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 also kind of, you know, develop new ideas and pursue new directions as a result of that. So. I think that's really beautiful. Um, so, oh, look, we got we've got a question. So, uh, so this is from uh, Shrilaxmi. Uh, she says, or he says, a great talks and stories. Does penetrance have a role in the manifestation of Rett syndrome in individuals with MECP2 variants, particularly in females? And how does one think about this in designing genetic screening panels? Does anyone want to take that? I can maybe start, and Adrian would probably would add because it's about the patient uh, from a patient perspective. In general, if the patient has a null or severe mutation and random X inactivation, which most of red girls when they present, that's what they have. The syndrome is pretty, you know, a full spectrum. You see all the features of red syndrome. Milder mutations they will have a milder phenotype. We heard about the R306C from Jeff and, uh, and also in mice from Adrian. So these would be milder. There will be an occasional patient who would have a, a severe mutation and they have a milder phenotype. While in peripheral blood, we don't see evidence of non-random X chromosome inactivation, we cannot exclude that in the brain they have favorable X inactivation. So at this time, all the data we have 
is really about ex inactivation modifying penetrance of the phenotype. In males, it pretty much correlates with the severity of the mutation. I don't doubt that there's some background effects because in mice, we know the genetic background of the mice will slightly shift the survival curve, but it doesn't really change the course of the disease. So it's a pretty penetrant gene. And Adrian, I don't know what your thoughts are about that. I agree entirely. I mean, there are correlations, as, as Jeff said, you know, um, severity even for a single mutation is somewhat variable. You could never say to someone with R133C, this is going to be milder. Statistically, it's more likely to be mild, but individually, there's so much overlap. And that overlap is either due to X chromosome inactivation or it's due to other modifiers. And there is a fair amount of evidence that there are other mod modifying um, genes out there. Uh, Monica Justice has, has come up with a few. Um, so uh, it, it could well be that the, the, the modulatory effect is, is, is due to background, but it's modulatory and penetrance, if you just look at the major phenotypes, is, is as Buddha says, I agree, totally very high. Brilliant, Perhaps thanks. One, maybe I could add one thing from human data. I should have thought about that. If we take the same mutation now, and look in a male where you don't have the confounding effect of X chromosome inactivation, the one mutation, the alanine-140V, which is a milder mutation, has a spectrum of phenotype. In some patients, it's my present with autism, hyperactivity, OCD, in others, juvenile onset schizophrenia, and others, bipolar. So this, but still we're on the same spectrum, if you will, of neuropsychiatric phenotypes. Um, okay, Th thanks for that. Um, so I guess we've also, I, I was going to ask you anyway, so um, again, I'll ask you each in turn, uh, maybe to say uh, where you think the field is going in general and what uh, particular aspects uh, you are uh, interested in pursuing um, in the next few years and in the longer term. Maybe you start with Adrian this time. Yes, I think um, you know what what everybody's waiting for is 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 um, some kind of therapeutic breakthrough. And uh, for me, I have to say, as, a, as coming it from from the sort of uh, genome side of things, what what the world is sort of waiting for is efficient editing. You know, there there's mistakes have been made in the writing of this uh, DNA uh, in germ cells, usually in in males, of course, uh, and one would like to be able to rewrite and correct. Uh, at the moment, we can identify those those changes, but rewriting them is not so easy. And I would say gene therapy is a sort of a bit of a blunderbuss approach. One's putting in um, uh, a, a, a relatively uncontrolled amount of virus. I think this could well be therapeutically very beneficial, but probably um, only if one stays uh, below the threshold where overexpression is a danger. Um, but I think it's always going to be uh, second to being able to go in and surgically change back the DNA to get back uh, the, the, the original sequence. My feeling is that the pharmacological approaches, but I may be wrong about this, are less likely to produce huge effects and that changing the, the actual genes or introducing the correct gene in the right amount, and one can do that in several ways, RNA editing is an alternative way, would be the way to really get back most of the functions that are compromised. Uh, but that's not to say don't bother with the pharmacological approach. It's it's just to perhaps a prejudice because predicting the future in these things is notoriously um, risky. Yes, it definitely is. I, I've noticed we always get asked what, what the predictions are for the next 10 years. And it's it's it, it, it's a kind of lose-lose situation because, you know, you're bound to not get it exactly right. Um, anyway, uh, sorry, Huda, what, what would you say? Uh, I would agree with Adrian. I think the most elegant and safest way to really correct for the loss of this protein is to edit the mutations. We need to solve gene therapy for that just to deliver the editase. And this editing could be at an RNA level, but eventually if we can do it at a DNA level, that would be fantastic. You can hit all the mutations and this could be a technology for other developmental disorders. So I think we do need to hopefully solve the issue of delivery so that we can hit as many neurons as possible to get a meaningful correction. That's the dream. In between, what do we do 
And I think anything we can do to keep the red child as healthy as possible, we will gain more milestones with her when we eventually try whatever therapy we hope to try. Uh, so I think to me, that part is really important. And this is why I think the idea of early training could be helpful, hopefully. The second thing I would say, I would not uh, forget about all what we're learning about the brain. And we've done something really, you know, it's done in human patients. For Nacelle stimulation is done in human patients, but it only hits one phenotype. Eventually, if there are going to be strategies to somehow stimulate neuronal activity more broadly, non-invasively, that will be beautiful. So I would add in the meantime, until we have the dream therapy, uh, additional modalities of therapeutics that could affect circuit function and make the girls function better. Can I just uh, ask um, Hoda a question yes. about that? Just um, yes. Obviously, regarding breathing, uh, in a sense, they've had a lot of practice at breathing. Uh, uh, so do you think that the breathing phenotype is already ameliorated by the fact that those circuits are heavily used since they were born? And would be more severe um, if, uh, you know, right. an imaginary scenario so, where they hadn't been using it. Right. It's really interesting question, Adrian. And I have to say the breathing phenotype is a little bit connected to other circuits. Because as you know, red girls tend to do that when they're awake. During sleep, their breathing takes a much more normal breath pattern. And if they're anxious or in a new environment, it is exaggerated. So the complexity of the breathing phenotype is really very interesting. But if I was to predict what would be the first phenotypes to perhaps reverse and respond to therapy, I would hope the breathing and epilepsy, because those are uh, physiological phenotypes, and if, if you, the neurons are not physiologically functional, I hope they would be the first to, to, to reverse, whereas language, cognition, motor activities, you may have to train for the person to really gain the skill set, because they may have missed out on that early training, uh, you know, as an infant when they do all these things. So I agree, this may be one of the first to reverse. I guess I have a question kind of related to that, which is, um, why do you, Hudo, why do you think that um, the late training uh, was ineffective? Uh, what do you think is distinctive about the effects of training versus, for example, genetic rescue? Well, I don't think training would replace genetic rescue. I think the genetic rescue, you're normalizing the protein in all neurons, and it takes time. It takes about you know, at least in our hands when we did the rescue and the duplication, whether genetic or ASO, it did take a few weeks from the time you normalize the protein. So somehow something is happening where the chromatin is changing, gene expression changing, the physiology of neuron is changing. With the protein missing, uh, and I, again, it may be what you asked, phase of the training. Maybe you have to continue it at different phases as you go on. All of that has to be tested. So the genetic rescue is a much more robust way to bring health to these neurons. Whereas in late training, somehow you may now have put the neuron in an epigenetic state that just simply tweaking its activity is not cutting it. Whereas bringing the protein back is cutting it. It did show some benefit on the motor level, but nowhere close to the early. And I hope by us studying these neurons now, interrogating their genetic expression patterns pre and post symptomatic will learn something from that. I really don't have data yet. Why are they different? Thank you. And okay, so now we got some, yeah. <laughs> um, so we have some more questions coming through now. So uh, first from Richard Morris, um, uh, he says, lovely talks from both of you. Thank you. Uh, with respect to early training, obviously early diagnosis will be helpful. But how much can one teach to a 12-month or even two-year-old baby that would then be really beneficial to them later in life? Uh, and then I guess motor functions would be really helpful. Right. Thank you, Richard. So I actually think there's a lot you can teach to a baby, even at four months of age. Typically, for example, babies are now you know, uh, put on their abdomen to, to strengthen their tone, but they put three to five minutes. If you knew a child has Rett syndrome, you may put her 
on her tummy to strengthen her core, 15 minutes. Uh, there are so many steps that can be taken, even with sitting. So there are a lot of core training you could do with infants that now we're not doing. We're letting the infants just develop at their own pace. And, you know, even in healthy neurotypical infants, there are a, a lot of variability. The same is true about language. The same is true about use of the hands. So I envision a lot of steps. First, predominantly in the motor domain, but even if one focuses on a few words that the, these girls will hear and they'll get intensely trained on very specifically, they might retain some of these words and they may have better understanding. And my bet is if you delay a few symptoms of the d disease early on, you might be able to work with them longer to continue that process. We wouldn't know. We would have to have a trial like everything else. The beautiful thing this kind of trial, if we had newborn screening, would only have to be done with the intervention because what Jeff shared with you today, we have plenty natural history data. So we will quickly learn if we're making a difference. Fantastic, thanks. Um, so we've got a question from David Price uh, saying, fascinating, thanks. Does loss of MECP2 bring developmental critical periods to an end prematurely? Maybe Adrian? Not, sure it's not a big authority on critical periods. Um, I mean, the the um, the only thing I would say is that I that uh, you know, it's, it's, if a critical period were to be brought to a premature end, I would have thought whatever that critical period was critical for would be incomplete, and that would imply that if you put MECP two back, would not. Um, reverse because that critical period hadn't finished yet uh, and um, you know while there are still questions about whether absolutely everything is reversed certainly an awful lot of things are reversed so that would argue that most critical periods have been completed um, based on that sort of um, uh, logical interpretation of the question but um, uh, I, uh, I don't know if Huda has anything to add on that I agree with Adrian. You've got two different models, the loss of the gain. When you do reversal in the adult, you do reverse most of the symptoms. Now, I will give you an example with the duplication. When we reversed anxiety, we it was harder to reverse in our humanized model. It, it reversed in the uh, earlier model where we did continuous infusion of the ASO. So we'll have to see if, for example, anxiety is more resistant and it will take a longer. But I don't think that has to do as much with critical period as it has to do when you experience anxiety as an infant, you may carry it with you longer and it may be harder to reverse and it may take some additional therapy and training. I think to me the most encouraging is the fact we could reverse so many phenotypes, even as late as seven to nine months of age, I showed you with the epilepsy. So at least I can say safely in mice, if critical period play a role, contribute, it's really small. It's not as much for the major phenotypes because those have been reversed both in Adrian's lab uh, in the loss of function in our lab and the gain of function. Now, whether humans, because they have a longer critical period, it's gonna be a different, there'll be a little bit more carryover, we don't know. But again, having baby early diagnosis, newborn screening eventually will help us discern that because we can do trials in both early diagnosed children and later diagnosed children and learn how much longer it may take to reverse or if there's some things we have to work on. Only clinical trials will teach us that. I think the yeah, question, just you. to come back to the question about reversibility, in the, in the, at least in the genetic reversibility of, of Rett syndrome, uh, Jeff Newell alluded to the fact that you don't really know if the slightly incomplete uh, rectification of some uh, phenotypes is due to the fact that they are irreversible or due to the fact that you're not actually ever putting back uh, MECP2 in absolutely all cells. And, and I think that's a complicated question to ask, answer. Um, and one can get quite high with the uh, rest restoration of MECP2 in neurons, but it, no one's really ever got it to 100%, and it may vary in different regions of the brain as well. So. 
you know, sorting out the distinguishing between those two possibilities is not is non trivial and hasn't really been addressed. Yeah, that's a very good point indeed. Um, okay, so we've got a couple more questions. Uh, first one is from Eamon, uh, who says, at the population level, does individual variation in MECP2 expression, i.e. through EQTLs, affect DNA methylation patterns or behavioral outcomes? Well, can I just say, MECP2 is a reader of DNA methylation, and no one's convincingly shown that it has a, a big effect on uh, the pattern of DNA methylation. It reads it, it doesn't write it. Uh, as Huda pointed out, DNMT3A uh, and also DNMT3B for CPG methylation, um, these, these de novo methyltransferases collaborate to lay down the DNA methylation pattern. And that's done pretty early in development, and uh, that pattern is affected by um, the activity of genes at those very early stages. Uh, it's, it's, this is really before MECP2 uh, concentration goes up uh, very high, uh, or at least is at the same time. I don't think there's anything at the moment connecting uh, MECP2 and DNA methylation patterns. I agree. But to, to maybe address one other part of the question, which is, could there be a 20% change in expression levels of MECP2 that may predispose someone to a neuropsychiatric phenotype? And I think that's a possible, that's a possibility, but there are no data as of yet. What we do know from recent studies we've done that as little as 30% change in the level of this protein, and this study is currently in press, we do see changes in behavior closer in the neuropsychiatric realm. So I think one would have to do these studies to see if in patients with psychiatric disorders, there's a, a subset that may have changes in the level of this protein. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, okay, and then we have a question from Leandros Bukas, who says, let me see if I understand. In terms of understanding the molecular pathogenesis of Rett syndromes and related disorders, it seems that multiple subtle changes throughout the entire genome combine to disrupt cellular function and produce the phenotype. How do you think we should proceed in studying this? Not sure whether it's by genome, but anyway. I can start maybe, and you've heard from both Adrian and myself that many genes have altered gene expression. Many of these genes are important for transcription. Some of them are transcription factors, some of them are chromatin remodeler, and some of them are synaptic proteins. The majority of the genes that are altered are altered in, by small percentages, 10 to 20 percent uh, in general. However, there is a subset of genes that we found to be altered by 50 percent, 30 to 50 percent, and interestingly, many of those genes on their own, any one of them with either haploinsufficiency or duplication also cause autism spectrum disorder phenotype. So you, you're, you got a number of genes that are altered and I think any one of them can cause one or more phenotypes. So you have now dozens of them altered in this, uh, at least in the animal models. And I'm sure this all contributes to the pathogenesis. But at the end of the day, it comes down to altered neuronal activity. And some of these genes may be altered because of altered neuronal activity. The neurons are functioning at 70% of their normal capacity. And perhaps somehow if we can correct that with gene replacement or any other modality till then we could help that. And I agree, there are two alternative hypotheses. One is that um, there is a global deoptimization of neuronal gene expression uh, due to uh, a, a constellation of tiny changes, uh, and that and that um, that's a sort of counsel of despair in a way, because reversing that is not going to be trivial unless you reverse the genetic um, uh, lesion that, that from which it originates. And the other possibility is that there are a few genes, uh, as, as Huda was saying, that, that matter more, and we don't actually know which it is. Um, but obviously, if there were five genes or even two genes. Uh, whose products being upregulated or downregulated in overexpression or whichever way they go, um, were uh, primarily responsible for the phenotypes, 
that would be uh, therapeutically very good news. And I think we have to try to test which of those two hypotheses is correct. And of course, uh, it could be, this being biology, a mixture of the two. Some genes are more important than others, but actually they all matter a bit. Thank you, Adrian. Um, so I think probably we should wrap up our um, panel discussion there, because um, I'm under extremely strict orders from uh, Martin not to go over time. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, Adrian Bird and Huda Zogby very much for participating in this panel discussion and for um, an optimistic take on the future where I think there's going to be a role for, uh, obviously, in the long run, editing and gene therapy, but also for many other approaches that uh, could be beneficial. Um, I'd also like to thank all the speakers from today. So thanks to Jeffrey Newell, giving a great talk on um, the road towards clinical trials, uh, really excellent um, flash talks from our three speakers, Alan Bayat, Sidney Lehman, and Rika Han Koford. Um, and uh, apologies to people who are now dropping questions in because I don't think we have time to address them. Um, uh, but and also, of course, to a lovely talk from Huda Zogby. And uh, so with that, um, it's been a really great pleasure uh, hosting uh, this particular session. Um, I think it's been a wonderful meeting that I've certainly enjoyed hugely. I hope you have. Um, of course, I'd also like to thank the audience uh, for asking excellent questions all the way through and participating. Um, and I am now going to hand over to Martin Meyer, who's the director of the Brain Prize, um, who will be announcing uh, this year's winners. Thank you very much. So thank you to Laura, Adrian and Huda for a, a really fantastic way to end what I think has been a truly remarkable meeting. Um, I'd also like to thank the other speakers for sharing their science, um, to the other moderators for fielding the questions and, and keeping us on schedule, and also to you, uh, the participants, for attending the meeting and also asking some great questions. I'd also like to thank um, the Scientific Organising Committee. We, we, we couldn't have done it without you. And on behalf of the Lundbeck Foundation and of the Brain Prize Selection Committee, I'd like to say congratulations once again to Huda and Adrian on the award of the Brain Prize for 2020. But now it's time to start looking forward to the future. So Brain Prize winners are selected by a panel of nine internationally renowned neuroscientists from around the world. And they base their selection on nominations that are submitted by you, the neuroscience community. And the nomination window for the Brain Prize 2022 will open in May and close in September of this year, 2021. So I strongly encourage you to submit nominations of those people whose work that you think is deserving. And now to the highlight of the Brain Prize calendar, which is when we announce the winners of the Brain Prize for 2021. You don't have to go anywhere, just stay online to find out who has won this year's Brain Prize. And I'd like to finish by saying once again, thank you for attending the Brain Prize meeting this year. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2021 Lundbeck Foundation Brain Prize. This year from the Planetarium Dome in Copenhagen, where I, due to the COVID-19 restrictions, feel a little lonely without all of you. We have an exciting program for this year's celebration of outstanding discoveries in brain science. We are going to meet the winners and the chairman of the selection committee and we will, hopefully, get new insights into a very special field of pioneering science. The Brain Prize is the world's largest award for brain science, and it is all about the people who dare, the people who dare to follow an idea, dare to persist. We would, of course, have preferred to celebrate them in person, but we have tried to bring them as close to you as technically possible. But first, I would like to introduce CEO of the Lundbeck Foundation, Lene Skole.
A warm welcome to the announcement of the 2021 winners of the Brain Prize. For more than 10 years, the Brain Prize has recognized scientists who have made groundbreaking contributions to global neuroscience. For me personally, and for the Lundberg Foundation as a whole, the announcement of the Brain Prize winners is the highlight of the year. Today is the 4th of March, which is also the date on which the Lundbeck Foundation was founded. 67 years ago, Grete Lundbeck, the widow of the founder of H. Lundbeck, established the foundation. And today, it's one of the largest commercial foundations in Denmark. Our aim is to improve lives by investing responsibly with a long-term perspective in healthcare companies and in public research with a special focus on neuroscience. And the Brain Prize highlights our devotion to the brain. We fund the brightest minds to tackle one of the world's greatest scientific challenges, understanding and treating disorders of the brain. Brain diseases impose an enormous and growing burden on patients, their relatives and society as a whole. Enabling new discoveries and bringing those discoveries to lives is the very essence of our purpose. The Brain Prize is our opportunity to acknowledge the brilliant minds that have pushed the frontiers of neuroscience and paved the way for improving brain health. Today, we are honoring four brilliant researchers who have dedicated their entire career to understanding the causes of one of the world's most common diseases of the brain. Together, they have accomplished what must have seemed impossible when they first embarked on their scientific journey. Their perseverance and talent have transformed an idea that emerged more than 40 years ago into novel treatments that will change the lives of millions and millions of patients across the world. We consider it an honor and our privilege to award them with the Brain Prize 2021. Now it's time for what we have all been waiting for. Exactly, Lena. The Brain Prize 2021 goes to a team of four professors from four different countries for their pioneering work on migraine. Between the many qualified nominations from all over the world, the selection committee chose to award the Brain Prize 2021 to Professor Lars Edvinson, Professor Peter Goldsby, Professor Michael Moskowitz, and Professor Jess Olesen. Congratulations to all of you. And to help describe the motivation for awarding the Brain Prize to these four scientists, a very warm welcome to Professor Richard Morris, Chairman of the Brain Prize Selection Committee and recipient of the Brain Prize 2016. Hello, Professor Morris. I'm sure everyone would like to start with the Selection Committee's motivation. Thank you, Lena. Um, I'm happy to share that with you. This is the Selection Committee's motivation. Migraine is one of the most common and disabling neurological conditions affecting humans. And the work of the four winners contributed to the clinically effective classification of the disorder and then to unraveling the key mechanisms relevant to its understanding, which have led on to a novel therapy and opened up possibilities for future ones. Uh, the work on migraine is a remarkable example of bedside to bench to bedside research, which has yielded tangible clinical benefit. Thank you, Professor Morrison. I was wondering if you could please give us an overview of the considerations in the selection committee to choose the winners for this year's Brain Prize. Well, as you've just heard, the Brain Prize for 2021 is awarded for fundamental pioneering work on migraine. An international group of four neuroscientists have discovered a key mechanism uh, that causes migraine, a, a condition affecting more than a billion people, um, which according to the World Health Organization is one of the most prevalent 
and disabling uh, of neurological diseases. Their research has paved the way to the development of an entirely new class of migraine-specific drugs called CGRP antagonists, which help to prevent migraine attacks in those who are affected. How does the selection committee actually find the winners? I guess it's not an easy task. Uh, not at all. Each year, the, the selection committee for the Brain Prize is, is faced with deciding amongst over a hundred nominations, uh, all of whom have done amazing biomedical science, uh, as to which one or which set of them is the most deserving for the prize that year. Uh, we read the nominations, uh, the scientific papers that the nominees have published, take up references on what we judge to be the best candidacies, and we meet on two separate occasions to discuss and then to decide. Now this year, of course, we had to do this virtually due to the travel restrictions. Um, but we know each other well, uh, so we're able to carry this out dispassionately as in every year before. Uh, yes, it's, it's difficult deciding on the winners. There's so many deserving candidates. And now, Professor Morris, I wonder if you could tell us more about the disease that the prize winners, Professors Edwinson, Goatsby, Moskowitz and Olesen, have been key to gaining an understanding of. Migraine is much more than a bad headache. It's a serious neurological disease with symptoms that include severe throbbing and, and recurring head pain, uh, nausea, um, vomiting, dizziness, extreme sensitivity to sound, light, uh, touch and even smell. And some migraine attacks can last for, for several days. In fact, many of us will know sufferers, perhaps in our own families, and, and, and understand their burden. In fact, more than four million people across the world suffer at least 15 migraine attacks per month. Now, for many, migraine severely diminishes the quality of their life, including the ability to work, and can lead to depression, anxiety, sleep disturbances. So the economic and social costs associated with migraine are also extremely high here in Denmark and across the world. So a severe disease indeed, but surely there have been treatments for migraine for some while. Yes, there have been, including some readily available drugs like uh, paracetamol, uh, but their efficacy is incomplete. Others are more powerful, but they can have significant side effects. And on top of that, their, their action tends to be against an existing attack that's already underway and may not prevent future ones. Uh, there was, therefore, a, an urgent need to develop new classes of migraine-specific drugs. Can you tell us a bit more about the prize winners and their scientific journeys? One of the characteristics of, of contemporary science is teamwork. We've seen that, all of us, during the last year. Uh, with the astonishingly fast development of vaccines, a, a task made possible by the rapid sequencing of the genome for COVID back in January of last year. But you have to know where to start, and the problem in migraine has always been, where do we start? Now, in this case, it's been a long adventure story, but one with a, a satisfying, if still incomplete, conclusion. One step was taken by Michael Moskowitz, a professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School, who was the first to suggest that substances known as neuropeptides may be involved. Some are released from trigeminal nerve fibers that innervate the thin membrane surrounding the brain, the meninges, and its associated uh, blood vessels. This is one of the only areas of the brain to monitor pain. And then? Well, the story then moves to Sweden, where a young Australian doctor, Peter Goadsby, had come to work specifically with Professor Lars Edvinson at Lund University. And they jointly identified a neuropeptide called calcitonin gene-related peptide, or CGRP. And CGRP is released by trigeminal nerve fibers during a migraine attack, and it's, uh, one of its actions is to dilate cranial arteries. And so they therefore wondered if CGRP might be of central importance to migraine as well as to cerebral blood flow. Now at this point, a Danish clinician, Jess Olesen, who's now a professor at the Rieshospitalet in Copenhagen, where, where the Danish headache center's located, he comes into the picture, asking the critical question, 
is CGRP release a cause or a consequence of migraine? Which is the chicken and, and, and which is the egg? And I take it that he found out that CGRP was the cause? Well, he got ethical permission to do a brave experiment with people, to administer CGRP and see what happened. And his team found that doing so brought on a migraine. And later, that giving the drug which blocked the action of the receptor at which CGRP operated would prevent this from happening. But that wasn't quite the end of the story. Showing that something is definitively the case in science and medicine is, is, is a tall order. Uh, there were many more things to be done. Professor Ollison spent a great deal of time working with numerous doctors internationally to ratify the various different types of migraine and to create a diagnosis system uh, that would be accepted worldwide. And this has been really important for clinical trials. Uh, Peter Goadsby, who, as we've seen, had traveled all the way from Australia to Sweden to take part in some of the, the early work with Lars Edvinson, is now a professor at King's College London, where he directs a laboratory and a clinical research facility. He and, and Professor Edvinson in Sweden have since worked extensively together on migraine and cluster headache uh, leading directly to new drugs called Gipants and CGRP monoclonal antibody treatments. They've um, explored migraine and cluster headache mechanisms in both laboratory models uh, and in human experimental medicine, um, while Dr. Goadsby also maintains an active clinical practice that focuses on creating real translational benefits for patients with headache disorders. So this is an example of a bench-to-bedside success? Yes, uh, that's right. It, it started at the bedside, moved to the lab, uh, and then has gone back and forth between fundamental and clinical research to define and refine the novel treatments. So like the work we described last year, brain science is not always very straightforward. You may have little idea what is going to unravel along the journey. That's right. Um, and in this case, working in four separate places gave us insights into what to look for. Uh, the finding of a possible target, seeing that it's released during a migraine attack, establishing it having a causal role in the disorder by showing that blocking it or where this peptide acted in the brain prevented migraine uh, were all parts of this big jigsaw puzzle. Uh, this jigsaw puzzle of some importance given the sheer number of people affected by the condition across the world. Hmm. It's a fascinating story, but are there any closing remarks that you as chairman of the selection committee would like to add to the amazing story of the Brain Prize 2021? Well, I, I think it's important to note that the research hasn't ended. Uh, the Lumbeck Foundation looks upon this still evolving scientific story uh, as another fine example of where basic science and careful experimentation are walking uh, hand in hand. So, um, on behalf of all of the members of the selection committee, I offer my congratulations to professors Michael Moscovich, Lars Edmondson, Jess Ollison and Peter Goadsby. Thank you very much, Professor Morris, and congratulations to you and the selection committee on finding these winners. Now, we would love to have had the winners here on stage, but due to COVID-19 restrictions, we had to interview them separately in different parts of the world. Professor Moskowitz, it seems that you somehow started it all, or at least triggered something really significant with your Lancet hypothesis in 1979 about migraine. It was clear that migraine lacked a coherent pathophysiology and effective treatment. The prevailing vascular hypothesis proposed that dilated blood vessels caused headache. The data just didn't support it. The Lancet hypothesis proposed that vessel dilation during headache was due to the action of vasodilating peptides. These peptides are released from sensory fibers surrounding blood vessels in the brain's capsule or meninges. The stimulation of these nerve fibers, accompanied by neuropeptide release, was what caused acute headaches. When we proposed the Lancet hypothesis, nothing was known 
about vasoactive peptides in meningeal sensory fibers. The formulation was based on meager evidence. Substance P was the only known vasoactive peptide in sensory fibers at that time. Other peptides like CGRP and PACAP were not discovered in the meninges for at least six more years. So the 40-year-old hypothesis emphasized that understanding this final common pathway for pain transmission and its released neuropeptides may suggest new strategies for treatment and prevention. It refocused the migraine field for the next four decades. How did you go about discovering the sensory innovation to the circle of Willis and its first vasoactive neuropeptide? To explore the Lancet hypothesis, my lab traced for the first time sensory fibers in the circle of Willis to the trigeminal ganglia. We followed this by identifying the first vasoactive peptide within this pathway, substance B. We anticipated the discovery of other neuropeptides because only a fraction of meningeal sensory fibers contained the peptide we were working with. Importantly, we showed that vasoactive peptide release from sensory fibers in meningeal tissues caused inflammation. We named this pathway the trigeminal vascular system. Using this knowledge, we provided a new mechanism of action for acute migraine drugs. We determined that the ergots and tryptans inhibited neuropeptide release, including CGRP, by acting on serotonin receptors on sensory fibers. Our findings also led to the discovery of a new serotonin-based anti-migraine treatment in the clinic. The trigeminovascular roadmap now provides the site of action for more than 20 drugs in the clinic. It's among the few examples in neurology where drugs were developed by intent rather than by chance. What were the steps that led you to propose a headache triggering event within the brain causing migraine headache? And how good is the evidence? Although the trigeminovascular system was important to migraine, lacking was an upstream trigger for pain. Cortical spreading depression or CSD provided the answer to part of that puzzle. CSD is an intense, slowly propagating wave of discharging neurons and glia that underlies migraine aura. Using high resolution imaging techniques, we found that brain changes during visual aura and CSD in animals were remarkably similar. We then made the following three observations about CSD that it could activate meningeal sensory fibers and contribute to pain. It caused meningeal inflammation that is blocked by anti-migraine drugs. It can be suppressed by drugs used in migraine prevention. Finally, bringing the research focus back to humans, we recently observed an inflammatory signal within the human meninges overlying the occipital cortex in uh, migraineurs with visual auras. The signal appears reminiscent of inflammation after cortical spreading depression in animals. It's yet another example of successful bench-to-bedside research in migraine. An impressive story, Professor Moskowitz. But I know it doesn't end there. Let us go on to Professor Peter Goatsby. Could you tell us a little about how you started to work on CGRP and your early influences? I was lured into headache research by my mentor, Jim Lance in Sydney, and I was interested in the trigeminal nerve, the pain, the pain nerve of the head, as it might be described. And I attended a meeting in southern Sweden in June of 1985. I listened to a simply brilliant lecture by a then young medic, physiologist and pharmacologist Lars Edvinson, who talked about the trigeminal system and its protective effect on the brain, including the role of neuropeptides. I was taken by this. I, I thought there was something that would happen that could be related to headache in what he was discussing. I approached him, he was very gracious, we sat down, we talked for some time and designed a series of experiments to test our models, our experimental models in humans to get bench to bedside to bench to bedside translational validation of where we were headed to understand if these newly described neuropeptides could have a role in headache disorders, and if there was a role in headache disorders, which one was the most important one. 
we came to CGRP, calcitonin gene-related peptide, has been important in both migraine and cluster headache. And this turns out to be certainly the case. Tell us more about how you have worked with your colleague Lars Edvinson. We've collaborated looking at other neuropeptides, pituitary adenylate cyclase activating polypeptide, helodermins and helospectins, trying to understand the physiology and pharmacology, the background to how these transmitters can change the central nervous system, change the cerebral blood flow, change the circulation and be harnessed to understand primary headache disorders. How important is this work to you? It's been my career aim to make the world a better place for people with headache disorders. It's a privilege to be able to apply scientific principles and approaches to understand disorders that are, generally speaking, have been ignored. And to improve the lives in that way of many, many patients who were disabled by these dreadful conditions. Development of these medicines has been a privilege and an honour, and I've been happy. I'm very happy to have been part of it. Thank you, Peter Goatsby. The story now travels from Australia to Sweden and Denmark. Let us hear from Professor Lars Edvinson. When did you consider CGRP important for migraine pathophysiology? Well. I had been a frequent guest at Migraine Trust conferences in London over many years and had begun thinking of migraine pathophysiology and if my work could fit in. When we found and described CGRP in the tridium novascular system 1984 and uncovered its role in regulation of cranial vasculature, I thought it was a distinct possibility. The invitation to write a review in Trends in Neuroscience 1985 came very handy and I did put forward my thoughts and described the connection and the hypothesis. When did you actually feel you had proven a role of CGRP in migraine? Well, it was very clear to me that following the collaboration work with Peter Goadsby on patients with migraine and other primary headaches that CGRP was a key player. In acute attacks, we only observed that CGRP was released into the jugular venous blood in patients suffering migraine attacks. No other neuropeptide had such a strong correlation. It was also underpinned by the effect of triptans. Sumatriptan acutely not only removed the pain in the migraine attack, but at the same time CGRP was normalized. When were you sure it would help blocking CGRP in patients and result in meaningful relief? Well, it took many years to translate our findings to meaningful medication. One hurdle was the unique structure and function of the CGRP receptor. It turned out to be a type B of G-protein coupled receptors, coupled to ramp 1 to make a functional receptor. After this observation, industry succeeded in producing a series of CGRP receptor blockers, which during the time period 2001 to 2009 were studied and shown to be effective medications. During the last decade, the GPENs have been modified in order to be without side effects. We have now, in addition, a number of monoclonal antibodies directed towards CGRP or the CGRP receptor for migraine prophylaxis. But what really matters is that patients are relieved of the pain. So I will have to deal with all the mails I get from grateful patients all over the world. Thank you. That's really touching. And last, but certainly not least, Professor Yes Olesen, is there a reliable way of diagnosing migraine? Yes, there is, but it was not possible before 1988. Uh, at that time, we published the first international classification of headache disorders as a result of several years of extensive committee work. It included uh, so-called explicit or unambiguous diagnostic criteria for more than a hundred different kinds of headache. For migraine, these diagnostic criteria have remained unaltered through three editions of the classification, and they are used all over the world. 
They have been shown to be highly reliable, reproducible, and have greatly facilitated migraine research. Can you describe the finding that made you believe that the mystery of migraine can be solved? Uh, it was actually believed to be almost a black box, impossible to penetrate. But as a young doctor, when I had become an expert in brain blood flow measurement in human beings uh, during my doctoral thesis, uh, we studied migraine patients and saw that the procedure itself triggered a migraine attack. Therefore, we could follow measurement after measurement during the migraine attack, what exactly happened, and it was completely similar to an animal experimental phenomenon called cortical spreading depression. Those uh, measurements put an end to the prevailing ischemic theory of migraine, which said that migraine is caused by a spasm of the uh, constriction of the arteries to the brain and insufficient blood flow to the brain. That theory was dead and instead replaced by the cortical spreading depression theory. How were you able to study the importance of signaling molecules in migraine? The problem with migraine is that it occurs in attacks and it's unpredictable. So therefore we thought of provoking attacks and attacks are really very unpleasant and painful, but they do not hurt the organism in any way. So this would be ethically completely permissible. So we developed this human model where we deliberately gave uh, naturally occurring substances that we thought would induce a migraine attack and uh, showed if they could or could not do, uh, induce the attack. So using this model, we identified several signaling molecules that can actually cause a migraine attack. What was the role of the model in the development of therapies targeting CGRP or its receptor? Well, I knew from the work of my colleagues Edwinson and Goldsby and others that CGRP was an interesting molecule. And I used it to uh, provoke migraine in the model that I just mentioned. So when we gave CGRP into a blood vessel in the arm, it could induce a migraine attack. I followed this up and showed that if we block the effect of CGRP, it was safe to do that. And finally, uh, I headed the first drug trial in patients showing that a compound that blocked the CGRP receptor was effective in migraine attacks. And thus we proved the principle of CTRP antagonism for migraine. Thank you to Professors Edvinson, Goatsby, Moskowitz and Olesen for this inspiring glimpse of the frontiers in a very special field of brain science. On behalf of the Lundbeck Foundation, I congratulate you once again on your achievements and this year's Brain Prize. Hopefully we will be able to hand over the prize in person this autumn and celebrate you physically just as we hope to have all of you with us here in Copenhagen next year. Until then, thank you all.